a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. You get a call that a woman has been badly beaten. The circumstances indicate foul play. Your job? Check it out. The nation's top golfers and sports writers have named Ben Hogan Professional Golfer of the Year. Ben, of course, smokes Chesterfields. But let's hear what he has to say about them himself. I'm a Chesterfield smoker and have been for seven years. The reason's simple. Chesterfield is the best for me. They're milder and they taste great. Try them yourself. Take that suggestion from Ben Hogan today. Try Chesterfield, regular or king size. They're low in nicotine, highest in quality, really mild, really satisfying. Chesterfield, best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, November 17th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. We were on our way back from the main jail, and it was 11.27 p.m. when we got to room 42. Homicide. we got to get that car radio fixed, Joe. It's getting worse all the time. Yeah, well, we can take it over in the morning. The thing almost knocked me right out of the seat when I called in the night. As soon as you press the button, bang, you get a shot. Yeah, well, I was out with Lopey yesterday. He picked up the mic, and I thought he was going to climb right out of the window. Yeah, well, that's pretty funny as long as you don't have to use the thing. There must be a short someplace, huh? Got to get it fixed. You know, I must have used a dollar's worth of dimes calling in today. This keeps up, I'm going to have to give up lunches. Well, that wouldn't hurt you either. That's not kind, Joe. I've lost seven pounds in the last two weeks. Where? I'm going to see about a transfer. Well, let's finish up this report so we can get out of here. What do you say? Okay, I'm with you. Hot shot, I get it. That's a robbery call, bar out in the Olympic. Oh, thought for a minute we were going to have to go out. All I want to do is get home and get some dry socks on. My feet are killing me. Yeah, well, I got an idea. If you'll stop talking and pick up a pencil, we can quit on time for a change. Another hot shot. I'll get it. Get your hat. Beating out in Hollywood. Yeah? Woman found her laying in the gutter. She's still alive? Was when they got the call. We better step on it, though. Uh-huh. I don't know how long she's going to last. When we got to the address we'd been given by the complaint board, two radio cars from Hollywood Division were already there. An ambulance had arrived, and the crew was doing what they could for the victim. She was still alive, but the attendant said that she appeared to have a skull fracture in addition to possible internal injuries. From one of the officers who answered the call, we found that the victim had been sprawled across the sidewalk, her head in the gutter. Due to the heavy rain, a stream of water was running down and into a storm drain. The fact that the drain was above the victim's head appeared to be the only thing that saved her from drowning. The crime lab had been called, and the men from Hollywood Division were doing what they could to keep the crowd back in order to preserve any physical evidence that might have been left. The victim appeared to be a woman in her early 40s. The clothes she wore looked expensive, but they were badly torn. Her face was cut, and the men in the ambulance crew removed her immediately to Hollywood Emergency Hospital for treatment. An officer was assigned to her in the event she regained consciousness. When she was found, her left shoe was missing and there was no sign of any purse or wallet. None of the people who'd gathered in the crowd could give us an identification of her. 
The homes in the vicinity were large, and the area was sparsely populated. The nearest house to the place where the victim was found was at least 300 feet down the street. We talked to the people in the crowd and found that the man who'd made the original call was still supposed to be there. We checked with the officers in the radio unit, but they said they hadn't seen him. From them, however, we found that the call had been from the home of a Mr. and Mrs. Roger Heflin. We contacted them, and they came back to the scene and pointed out the man. Frank and I took him over to our car for questioning. All right, Johnson, you want to tell us what happened? I don't know. You called the police, didn't you? Yeah, I called them. You found her? Yes, sir. She was lying in the street like that. I got scared, and I called the police. I thought maybe she was dead. What were you doing up here this time of night? Just walking around. You live up here, do you? No. Where do you live? Got a room down a fountain. Let me see your identification, would you please? Oh, yeah. Here's my wallet. Any money in it? No. All right, let me have it. Yeah, here you are. Is this your true name? Cecil August Johnson? Yeah. Who's Mary Johnson? Hmm? I say, who's Mary Johnson? Who's she? My sister. Is this her address here on the card? Yeah. Hey, you aren't going to call her, are you? You aren't going to call her. Why? She'd be pretty sure about it if you did. She don't like me for me to get mixed up with cops. She don't like it at all. You ever been in an institution? Hmm? State institution. You ever been in one? Yeah. I was in Camarillo once. How long ago did you get out? Oh, a long time ago. Three days. long time ago. I haven't been there for a long time. What were you there for? Well, less than people. Who? I was in Camarillo. Why'd they send you there, fella? To get well. From what? Just well. Yeah, we know. What'd they want you to get well from? I was never in Camarillo. You haven't been drinking tonight, have you? Hmm? I said, you've been drinking. Yeah, a little bit. Where? Bar down Highway Boulevard. When they sent you to the hospital, what was the reason? I've never been to the hospital. You told us that you'd been in Camarillo. Well, that was to get well. Now, look, fellow, we asked you before. What for? They thought I was molesting people. Were you? No, I didn't hurt anybody. Did they say you did? Yeah. Who? A lady. They said I hit her. Did you hit her? Huh? I said, did you hit the woman? No, I never hurt anybody. You know who the woman is that you found? You aren't going to call my sister, are you? Do you know who the woman is? What woman? Now, look, fella, pay attention. The one you found tonight. Yeah, I've known her for a long time. What's her name? Grace. You know her last name? Hmm? Do you know her last name? No. You know, i never really been in camera. I just told you that. That's so? Why? I don't know. Just sometimes I like to do things like that. I, I don't have no reason. I just like to do it. Like, once I told my sister I killed a man, she almost fainted. I just like to do that once in a while. Things get dull, I like to get them started. Where'd you meet Grace? Bar down in Hollywood. I go in there all the time. I met her there. Did you meet her there tonight? Yeah. yeah, she was there. Said she had a fight with her old man. Said they had a real beef. She told me he hit her. Belted her right in the mouth. What do you think of a guy do a thing like that to a woman? Any man do a thing like that, he's no good. No good at all. They said I did it, too. Told my sister I hit a woman. Who said that? Other cops when they arrested me. When was this? When I was at Camarilla to get well. You under a doctor's care now? No. no I got real well at Camarilla. Real well. They let me go. You just got through telling us that you'd never been there. I'm a liar. You can't believe anything I say. I'm a real liar. My sister's all the time saying that about me. She says I'm a liar. That's one of the reasons she used to get sore at me. I'm such a liar. I was never there. You know where this Grace lived? No. I think it was up on Ledgewood Drive. I think that's where it was, on Ledgewood Drive. You know where the house is? Mm-mm. I never saw it. I was going to go up there one day and punch her old man in the nose. You know, because he hit Grace. I was plenty sore about it. He gave her a black eye. I was plenty sore. But I didn't. You know why? You tell us. Because I thought my sister would get mad at me. She always gets mad when I get in fights. And when I lie. She'd be real sore. She's got no sense of humor. Yeah. There's a guy at the hospital who had a real sense of humor. He's funny. He had a piece of inner tube and he wore it like a hat. Floppy, you know? He had a real great sense of humor. But my sister... She don't like anybody to laugh. How many times have you been arrested, fella? Maybe a couple. Here in Los Angeles? Yeah. All the time in L.A. Cops here don't like me. They got no sense of humor. None. I never saw such dull cops. All right, Johnson. You wait here. We got a few things to check out, and then we want to take you downtown. You aren't going to arrest me, are you? We'll see. Well, I hope not. My sister, she'd be real sore. Johnson? Hmm? Tell me something. Did you hit her? You mean, did I hit Grace? Is that what you mean? That's what I mean. No. I met her tonight, and she asked me to take a walk with her. To take a walk, that's all. Then all of a sudden, she was lying on the ground. I was pretty drunk. I didn't know what happened. Just all of a sudden, she was there, and I got scared, and I called the cops. But I didn't hit her. I wouldn't do a thing like that to Grace, not me. You believe that, don't you? Well, don't you? You've got to buy it. You've got it, because it's the truth. Is that right? 
Sure. It's the truth. Every word. Well, you said it yourself, didn't you? Hmm? You're an awful liar. 12.52 a.m. Well, one of the officers from a radio unit stood by with Cecil Johnson. We talked with Lieutenant Lee Jones from the crime lab. He told us that what footprints they'd found in the immediate vicinity of the victim had been destroyed by the rain. He told us that his crew was unable to find any useful physical evidence. The area was searched, but we failed to find either the missing left shoe or the woman's purse, if she'd carried one. We put in a call to the Hollywood Receiving Hospital. Dr. Elwin Terrell told us that the victim was suffering from a fracture of the skull and apparently several broken ribs. He told us that the woman was in a deep coma and she couldn't be questioned at that time. We asked him to contact us through the business office in the event that she regained consciousness. We questioned the people in the neighborhood, but they were of no aid. None of them recalled hearing any automobiles on the streets, and none of them could testify as to the people loitering in the area. 1.10 a.m. We took Cecil Johnson and had him detained at the city jail pending further investigation. A check of his record showed that he'd been sent to Camarillo twice on charges of molesting and violation of Section 245 P.C. He'd been released into the custody of his sister three weeks previously. Before he was placed in a cell, we got the name and address of the bar where he said he'd met the woman he called Grace. 1.40 a.m. Frank and I drove out to the place. It was located on Hollywood Boulevard near Las Palmas Avenue. There was only one other customer in the place when we went in. The bartender was cleaning up for the night. What'll it be? We're looking for Amel. I'm him. What do you want? It's not about that lousy Jackie, is it? What's that? You're cops, aren't you? Isn't this about Jackie? We're police officers, yeah. you got to understand, I thought he was an actor. You know, I thought he was just hanging around the place to take work calls. That's what he told me. I didn't have no way of knowing different. It's the truth. We don't know anything about Jackie. We'd like to ask you some questions about a man named Cecil Johnson. That crackpot? You know, I thought you were after me because of Jackie. Oh, there it goes again. Excuse me. Yeah. Hello? Here it is. No, he ain't here anymore. What? I don't care how the horse did. Jackie ain't here. Now, don't call me no more. You see, this guy Jackie's a book. All the time he's using my phone, and I don't know it. Yesterday, a couple of cops come in and put the arm on him. All day, the phone's been ringing. Yeah. From what they say, he's lucky he got arrested. He must have lost his shirt yesterday. Horse came in that paid 20 to 1. Boy, he really must have had it. I see. Now, what do you know about this Cecil Johnson? A creep. A real creep. Did you see him tonight? Yeah, he was in. About what time? Let's see, it was uh, just before the fight on TV. That'll make it about 6.45. Yeah, about then, about 6.45. He come in alone? Oh, yeah, always does. He don't have no friends. What time did he leave, do you remember? Oh, well, we stayed around and watched the fight. Got into an argument with a the guy. Then he left about, uh, let's see, I guess it must have been about 9.30, quarter of 10. You know a woman named Grace? We understand she's in here quite a bit. Grace, huh? Well, we've got a couple of Graces come in here. What's yours look like? About 42, dark hair, wearing a tweed coat. Excuse me a minute, huh? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, it is. No, he's not here. He won't be back, so stop calling. I don't care if it did pay that. Look, but I got no part in the action. Now, forget the number, huh? Jackie's gone. He's in the can. Yeah, he's pinched. Now, lay off, huh? Now, let's see. Dark hair, tweed coat. Oh, yeah, that'll be Grace Dillon. Dillon? Yeah, she's pretty much of a regular. D I L L. Yeah, I guess so. D-I-L-L-O-N. I guess that's the way to spell it. Well, what's all the questions? Something wrong? What time was she in here tonight? Who says she was? Well, that's what we understand. Oh. Oh, yeah, well, there's nothing wrong around here. No reason not to cooperate. She was here come in about 8. What time did she leave? Well, I guess it was 9.30, 9.45. Did she leave alone? i got to think about that. All right. Lots of people in here with the fights, you know. Let me think. Uh, I'm going to tear that thing right out of the wall. He ain't here. He's been pinched. I don't know when he'll be back, and I don't care. You know, come to think about it, I think she left with that Cecil. Johnson? Yeah. Did he want to have much to drink, do you know? Well, Cecil had a couple of beers. That's all he needs. Don't take much with him. How about the Dillon woman? She was feeling no pain when she got here. Really carrying a load. I finally told her to take a walk, told her I couldn't serve her no more. That's when she left. Her and Cecil were sitting right there next to each other. When I told her I wouldn't pour no more for her, she got hacked, and her and Cecil left. You know where she lives? Not right off. I-, I can look it up. We keep a list of people who come in here. Send them announcements about things, like when we get a new piano play, things like that. Oh, I see. I can look it up for you. Just take a minute. Fine, thanks. C A B C. Oh, here it is. Darby, Dexter, Dibbs. I wish he'd come in and pick up the tab we can. Oh, let's see. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. 2917 Ledgewood Drive. 2917. Thank you. You can take the card if you want. Don't make any difference to me if she never comes back. 
The way she carried on tonight. People just don't understand. What's that? You can just serve them so much. After that, you're pouring a hundred-proof trouble. You got to shut them off sometime. Uh -huh. She ever come in here with her husband? Dylan? Yeah. A couple of times. Quite a while ago, though. They came in late one night, sat back there in the booth, had a couple of quick belts. He drinks Irish whiskey, likes it neat. They had a big beef. I finally had to go back and ask him to go out. He's a real bum. He's mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The kind of guy where to know him is to hate him. You know the kind? Yeah. He ain't here. I don't care how much you lost. He's in the can. What? What? Oh, yeah, honey. Well, I didn't know it was you. Uh-huh. Hey, yeah, I'll be home early as soon as I close up. Right. Yeah, well, I do, too. What? All right, honey. I love you. I do, too, mean it. Look, honey, there's a, there's a couple of men here I got to talk to, huh? Well, yeah, as soon as I close up, yeah. Hey, hey, goodbye, honey. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, all right. There. Bye. It's the, it's the wife we've just been married a couple of weeks. She's kind of, uh, you know. Yeah. Did Dylan ever hit his wife, would you know? Yeah, he did. She came in here one night with a mouse that had no end. Said her old man gave it to her. Say, what's all this about anyway? There's something wrong with Grace? Something happened to her? Well, we don't know yet. Well, let me give you this for free. If there's anything happened to a 6 to an even, it was her own man. It's a real bum. He's mean. Anything wrong, and it's him that caused it. You better talk to him. You'll find out. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, we will. Thanks. No, not at all. Glad to help out. All right. Good night. Uh, say, you guys going downtown? Yeah, that's right. To the jail? Yeah. Well, if you see Jackie, will you give him a message for me? All right. What's that? Tell him if he gets out, I don't want him back here no more. Okay. The guy ties up my phone. <laughs> Two twenty six AM. We got a description of the victim's husband and checked the name through R and I. We were unable to come up with any criminal record on him. Frank and I drove out to the address given us by the bartender. It was a large English stucco house, five blocks from where Grace Dillon had been found. We rang the bell and waited. An elderly woman answered the door and told us that Herman Dillon was not in. She explained that she was a babysitter and that she'd been called to take care of the couple's three children. She went on to say that Mr. Dillon left the house at approximately ten fifteen PM and had not yet returned. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout to be set up on the house. While we waited for the officers to arrive, the babysitter told us that the Dillons had constant fights. She said that on several occasions, Mr. Dillon had threatened to kill his wife if she didn't spend more time at home taking care of the children. She went on to explain that there'd been an argument that evening, and that after a loud fight, the wife had left the house. After she'd been gone for over an hour, Herman Dillon left to find her. 3.02 a.m., the officers arrived. We asked them to wait for the husband to return and then to notify us immediately. Frank and I drove downtown and checked into the crime lab. We talked with Lieutenant Lee Jones regarding his findings. He told us that he'd gone over the victim's clothing, but he was unable to find any physical evidence to help us in finding her assailant. 3.46 a.m. We checked into the office and put in a call to the hospital. How do you spell that, Doc? Huh? Uh, A-D-E. Yes, sir. Well, do you have any idea when that might be? I see, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, if you'll let us know. Right. Yeah, the business office here will know how to reach us. Right. Thanks again. Good night, Doc. How is she? Well, the doctor says he's finished his examination. She's got a frontal bone fracture, three broken ribs, cuts and contusions. She going to be all right? Yeah, you think so. So she might come out of it any time. Says it looks like she might have been thrown from a car. Well, that'd explain the missing shoe and purse, wouldn't it? Yeah. You have any idea when we can talk to her? No, might not do any good anyway. What do you mean? Well, the doc says this kind of fracture can produce a retrograde amnesia. Huh? She won't remember anything. Listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. It's taking place at your dealers, cigarette dealers, coast to coast. Smokers by the thousands are now changing to Chesterfield. Join them today, and you'll be smoking the only cigarette that gives you proof of low nicotine, highest quality. I want you to know that's a matter of record, and so is this. As I've been telling you, Chesterfield is the only cigarette. With this proven record with smokers, no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Good reasons why you should change to Chesterfield? You bet. Ask for Chesterfield. Regular or king size, best for you. <laughs> Four o 
before 2 a.m. Frank and I signed out of the office and we went home. At 5.13 a.m., I got a call that the husband of the victim, Herman Dillon, had returned home. The officers who called said that they were bringing him down to the city hall. I got in touch with Frank, and by the time we got to the squad room, Dillon was already there. He appeared dazed and acted as if he'd been drinking heavily. We sent out for some black coffee for him. He apparently didn't know what had happened to his wife. What's all this about, anyway? What are you dragging me out of my house like this for? Got a few questions we want to ask you, Dillon. What do you got that's so important you got to go through it at 6 in the morning? Why didn't you see your wife last? About 7.30 last night. Why? How do you and your wife get along? We've been married for 10 years. Not much of an answer, mister. You're not married. Been married 10 years and that's an answer. Been married 10 years, it's all the answer you need. Well, maybe you better spell it out for me. After that long, you have a few disagreements. Bound to. You know, being together all that time. You and your wife have a disagreement last night, did you? Yeah, we had a discussion. What about? I don't think that's any of your business. Yeah, well, maybe it is. Now, what'd you argue about? Her running around. Wasn't a real argument, just a discussion. Well, we got it. It was more than that. Then you got it wrong. We heard you hit her a couple of times. That's a lie. I might have shoved her a little. She had it coming, though, all the time running around. We got three kids, three little kids, and she doesn't care that for them. Always going out, hanging around those cheap bars, boozing it up. I came home the other night. She'd walked out and left the kids all alone, all by themselves. Didn't even get a sitter for them. Where you been tonight? Why? Why you have to know that? You want to tell us? Yeah. After Grace and me had the fight, she walked out. I waited for her to come home. Then when she didn't, I went out to find her. Did you? Hmm? Did you find her? No, I looked all over for her. All the bars along the boulevard, but she wasn't there. Where you been since the bar's closed? Walking around. And all this rain? Yeah. I've been trying to figure out what to do, trying to make up my mind. About what? What I should do with Grace. Things can't go on like this. They just can't. We've heard from some of your wife's friends that you made threats in their lives. Is that right? Who told you that? We just heard it. Is it true? Yeah, I suppose so. If I'd have found it a night, I'd have maybe killed it. I've never been so mad before. You see anybody you knew tonight? What? When you were walking around, did you see anybody you knew? No, why? When you got no way to prove where you were. Why do I have to do that? Might make things easier on you. Hey, what's this all about, anyway? Why are you asking all these questions about me and Grace? What are you trying to say? Where is Grace, you know? Yeah. Well, where is she? What's happened to her? She's in the hospital. She's had an accident. It's pretty bad. What kind of an accident? Looks like she was beaten. And you think I did it? Might have been you. She lied? Yeah. You think I beat her up? Did you? No. I maybe wanted to, knock some sense into her, but I didn't do it. You prove where you were tonight? Why? Can you prove where you were? No, I don't even know myself. Hey, you, you really think I did it? That's what we're trying to find out. You know, I was pretty drunk tonight. I got real loaded. That's a terrible part. Yeah, let me see your hands, will you? Why? Let me see them. All right. Put them up there, both of them. Here. Where'd you get those bruises? I don't know. I don't remember. You better try. This is pretty important. I told you I was drunk. There's only one thing that'll put bruises like that on your hands. Yeah. You hit something pretty hard. Herman Dillon was detained pending further investigation. We'd called the hospital, but there was no change in Mrs. Dillon's condition. Because of the lack of physical evidence, her testimony was essential in apprehending the person who'd beaten her. We had two prime suspects. Cecil Johnson, who was known to have been in her company when she left the bar. Johnson's record indicated that he was capable of committing the crime. On the other hand, the victim's husband had stated that he might kill her. He was unable to explain his movements at the time of the attack. The only person who could tell us the true story was the victim herself, and we had the doctor's statement that she might not remember the events immediately leading up to the beating. At 10.14 a.m. the following morning, the officer called from the hospital telling us that Mrs. Dillon had regained consciousness and could be questioned. The doctor told us that she was calling for her husband and asked that we bring Dillon with us. We went by the city jail and picked him up, and then we drove over to the hospital. The doctor told us that Mrs. Dillon was in a weak condition and that we couldn't talk to her at any length. Frank, Dillon, and I went into her room and waited for her to open her eyes. Is that you, Herman? Yes, dear. You're not mad at me, are you? You're not still mad at me? No, dear, I'm not. Oh, that's good. I was afraid you still were mad. You know, Herman, you shouldn't have hit me like you did. I know maybe I had a reason, but you shouldn't have hit me. Can you tell us what happened, Mrs. Dillon? Who are you? Police officers. What are you doing here? Trying to find out who did this to you. It wasn't anybody did it. Ma'am? It wasn't anybody. I did it myself. Silly so did it all by myself. I don't believe I understand, Miss Dillon. Him and me had a fight and I walked out. I was going to leave him. I went down and had a few drinks, just a few, and I got to thinking about me and Herman. Oh, I was such a bad wife. 
I got to thinking about the kids and how I was a bad mother. You aren't still mad at me, are you, Herman? Really, in your heart? No, Grace, I'm glad you're going to be all right. That's all that counts. You want to tell us what happened, Miss Dillon, please? I was on my way home. I was going back. Cecil was walking home with me. It was raining pretty hard, and we came to a gutter that was full of water. I stepped up on the curb to go around it. I didn't want to step in the water, and I fell. Fell down the hill, rolled all the way to the bottom, all the way to the next street. I remember falling. I remember laying in the street down below and how I couldn't move. I didn't know about anything else after that. Until just when you got here, Len, I don't remember much of anything. You mean that you fell down yourself, that nobody beat you up, huh? No. Herman hit me when I was home. He got mad at me and hit me. But he was right. You were right, honey. Real right. But it's going to be different, I promise you. Just as long as you ain't still mad at me, that's all that matters, that you ain't mad. Now, take it easy, honey. Everything's going to be all right. Just take it easy and try to get some sleep. I love you, Herman. I love you very much. And I'm going to make it all up to you, all the bad times. I'm going to make it all up to you. I love you, too, Grace. Now, you go to sleep. Get some rest. All right, honey. All right, thank you, Miss Dillon. We better go. You going to want me anymore, Sergeant? No, I don't think so. I wonder if she means it. If she really does. What's that? About making it up to the kids, how things are going to be different. Well, I don't know. She said she would. And that's just it. Hmm? She said it so many times before. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 18th, a meeting was held in the captain's office, Homicide Division. In a moment, the results of that meeting. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we've been getting letters from people all over the country telling us that they've switched to Chesterfield. Now, just as I've been telling you, thousands of smokers are changing to Chesterfield because only Chesterfield gives proof of low nicotine, highest quality. That's why I recommend you try them today. Regular or king size, Chesterfields are really mild, really satisfying. Best for you. Since no crime had been committed, no legal action was taken against Mr. and Mrs. Dillon. Cecil August Johnson was removed to room 5, Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, for further psychiatric examination. <laughs> Just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Jack Crucian, Vivi Janis, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely new Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork tip Fatima? It's the smooth smoke with Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Fatima is made and guaranteed by Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. Try Fatima today. Hear Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune tonight on the NBC Radio Network. You know, the only time San Francisco really gets hot is when a tourist calls it Frisco, and then it gets warm enough to give a sleigh dog a southern accent. Down around the waterfront, they don't care so much. 
And for a buck, you can insult anybody but Joe DiMaggio. The piers stretch out like a big yawn from south of the ferry building clear to the China docks. You push over on one side so you won't notice about the same spot you'll find dust in a bride's parlor. You find Pier 23. From there, it's a short skip to Johnny Madero's boat shop. My place. The sign outside looks honest, but down here, the only sign people pay any attention to is rigor mortis. I rent boats and do anything else you can blame on your environment. It works out all right. But pretty soon word gets around and you've got a reputation. It doesn't pay to argue, because even if you're leveling, you make as much headway as a whistler with a split lip. I found that out last Wednesday afternoon. I was looking out the window watching the tide come in when somebody in back of me coughed. When I turned, Nat Friendly was standing there in the office. He didn't say anything for a minute, and you noticed his eyes were as soft as the inside of a woman's arm. I had one of those faraway looks you couldn't follow with a road map. And then I saw the rest of him. He wasn't flabby, but he was on the way. And you got the idea he was an ex-fighter who settled down with a restaurant. I, uh... I got the right place, haven't I? If a woman screams, you haven't. What's on your mind? <laughs> that's a good question, Nadeau. That's a good question. Uh, that's what I want you to find out. Look, fellow, maybe I don't even want to be friendly. What's on your mind? I don't know, Nadeau. I don't know. All right, you convinced me. Now back out of here. We'll both be in the dark. Huh? Well, wait a minute, Nadeau. Listen to me. Uh, my name is uh, Nat Finley. My wife and I live up on Knob Hill, and I've been retired for a while, see? And... I don't, but go ahead. Well, you got to help me, Nadeau. I'll pay you 50 bucks a day to help me. At that price, it won't be help. I want you to find someone for me. But I don't know who or why, yet. We're back to that again, huh? Oh, listen to me. Lately, a name's been ringing in my ears. Just a name. Pete Sucho. Pete Sucho. Over and over again. So you read it somewhere. I don't know where I picked it up. For the last week, the name Pete Sucho has been on my mind. It's a, it's a nightmare. You've got to do something about it, Nadell. Change your diet. That might help. I want you to find Pete Sucho. Find out who he is, where he is, why he's bothering me. If you do, I'll, I'll give you a $200 bonus. Look, Finley, is this a job or a career? There must be a dozen sutras from here to Jersey City. Maybe, but the Pete Sutra I want lives right here in this town. He's got to. There's a law? Now listen to me, Mayor. Oh, last night, I, I kept hearing the name Sutra again. Only this time, there was an address, too. It was care of General Delivery, San Francisco. So he's got to be somewhere in this town. Why don't you check the phone book? I have, and the city directory, too. But so far, I haven't been able to locate him. Then I will, huh? Well, if you don't, you're still getting 50 bucks a day. What are you worried about? That 50 bucks a day? It might turn out to be a dream, too. You better throw in some advance money. Well, sure, Mattel. I brought a check along, just in case. Will $100 cover your doubts? Yeah, if the bank can cover your check. If they can't, you don't have to do the job. That's fair enough? Mm-hmm. Will you, will you start looking right away? Yeah. But you've got to be careful, Mattel. My wife's never to know about this, understand? Why? Because, well, she, uh, she doesn't like the idea. She... She thinks I'm a little crazy looking for a name like this. She hates me, I think. She thinks I'm crazy. Don't worry about her, Finley, until she starts mixing your nightcaps. For 50 bucks a day, I'll chase anybody's dream. Because with that kind of dough, you're rich enough to run down a couple of your own. When Finley left, I called the bank and found out his check had solid backing. So I went down to Lofty's and I put out some feelers on Pete Sutro. It didn't take long before one of the boys came up with a lead. A couple of other people were looking for Sutro, too. One was a guy named Marty Kane. The other was a torch singer named Evelyn Day. The word was that Sutro and Evelyn used to trade mash notes in Detroit. Well, I phoned the Jade Club where Evelyn was working, but she wasn't due for an hour. So I decided to give Marty Kane the first try. He was living in a motel out in the marina, so I went out. There was a sign outside that said Modern Cabins, but you knew Abe Lincoln did better in Illinois. The cabins were the size of an upper berth with enough holes to start a punch board. I didn't leave much privacy. You had more chance of keeping a secret from Matt Harry. I asked the manager where Kane's place was and he pointed to the end cabin. I went over and knocked on the door. Kane opened it and glared. His eyes were the color of Saturday night on a week old jag and he was so chunky he figured he'd be harder to move than an ice box through a basement window. Who are you? My name's Madero, Johnny Madero. Don't rhyme with anything. What are you looking for? A guy named Pete Sutro. I hear you got the same idea. So you got ears. I'll invite you in. Uh, I can't turn you down. Yeah, that's what everybody says about this gun. Now sit down, you get me nervous. Put away the gun and we'll both be calm, huh? After you tell me what you know about Sutro. I'm tracking down a dream. Yours? A client's. You sound anxious. What's your pitch? A wild one. Just say he owes me some dough and I need it bad now. You got the muscles? Take in laundry. I'll put you through the ringer first. I want to lead on Sutro. Yeah, we both do, but I'm not going down on my knees. Oh. Get up, Mazzaro. I don't want to make a liar out of you again. Yeah, you're tough, King. I'll bet you got your dander scared stiff. Yeah, and I'll start on yours now. 
What suits ought to you? Fifty bucks a day. A guy named Nat Finley hired me to track him down. Does that make you happy? No, just ambitious. Who's Nat Finley? He came in and paid me to find Sutro. He said the name was giving him nightmares. Sounds like a bedtime story, Madero. Well, if you don't like it, jazz it up. It's the truth. I read the wrong papers. Give me another version. All right, if you don't believe me, Kane, make up your own. Here's Finley's check. Can you read? If you'll help me with the big words. Give it here. Matt Finley. Yeah, Matt Finley. You want it, Lion. Looks like a good check. I'll take a chance. I'll cash it for you. It's giving you ideas, huh? Yeah, and the first one's about you. Here's your dough, Madeira. Now, get out. Get out quick. Oh, you're too good to me, Kane. Suppose the check bounces. It won't, Madeira, because I ain't going to cash it. Oh, I couldn't figure it. Kane looked at the check and smiled like a guy who just learned all about the atom bomb. I walked out, and the only thing I knew for sure was the demand for Pete Sutra was big enough to start a business boom. I headed back to my apartment to see how much lip I could bring down with an ice bag and a little pressure. When I got there, the door was open and the light was on. Inside, things looked even brighter. The brunette was draped over the couch like she paid the first installment on it. It was about 25 with a pair of legs that would have made a silkworm turn over and write a fan letter. She wore a tan business suit, and the way it was rumpled up, you knew office hours were over. When she saw me, she began to vibrate like an alarm clock at 6 in the morning. Good evening. I won't argue, but you got the wrong room. Will I regret it? I don't know you that well. Oh, you'll catch up with the crowd. My name is Sheila. I'm Matt Finley's wife. You should be somebody's wife. It cuts down on the risk. I want to talk to you. Go ahead. I'll try not to stare. Let's have a drink first, Mr. Madero. Maybe it will cloud your vision. Yeah, and the issue, too. Huh? Mm. You serve strong stuff, Mr. Madero. Soda? I'm all charged up now, lady. What's on your mind? I have a problem. Maybe you can help me. Maybe it's too late. I'm listening. It's about my husband, Matt. He tries, but he can't hide much from me. Now that you have the same trouble. Look, lady, you're working too hard for a sale. If you've got a point, make it. All right, Mr. Madero, we'll skip the intermission. My husband saw you tonight and sold you a wild story. Yeah, but it paid off. So far, I'm not complaining. But I am. I want you to drop the whole silly job Matt gave you. You're not building a case. Fifty bucks a day buys a lot of hangover, lady. You don't understand, Mr. Madero. My husband is a sick man. Yeah, I know. He can't sleep at night. He has a large imagination, and it's been getting worse lately. He, um, dreams up things. Sometimes I think... Sometimes I think he's a little crazy. Maybe it's a hobby. He can afford it. There are some things even he can't afford. Yeah, like finding Pete Sutro. That's right, Mr. Madero. There is no such man. Hmm. A guy named Marty Kane will give you odds. Who did you say? Marty Kane. He cashed in your husband's check, you know? No. No, I never heard of him. You don't sound so sure. Marty was talking about Sutro. All right, Mr. Madero. I'm talking about something else now. Money. So far, you're whispering. Shouting, Mr. Madero. Five hundred bucks worth. I'll give you five hundred dollars to drop the job and forget everything. Mm. All right, baby. You twisted my arm. You, um... You won't let me down, Mr. Madero. Will you? If I do, it'll be nice and easy. Finley had the kind of a wife you mate with a panther. She picked up her purse and peeled off 500 fish. She wasn't talking anymore, and when she swayed out, you wondered how much night practice she'd given that rumba. Well, I was all washed up with the Finleys. It felt good already. So did the dough. I felt like a guy whose name was just picked in a chain letter. My mind was free for the better things in life. So I called up a girl out on Van Ness and told her to meet me at the Regent Bowling Alley. I got there before she did, so I started warming up the alley. A few minutes later, it got a lot warmer because Inspector Warcheck of San Francisco Homicide began spoiling my game. Hello, madame. a nice strike. You're in the wrong kind of alley, Warcheck. What do you want? Some pointers? You got time? No. I can see how you hold a bowling ball. Now show me how you hold a gun, huh? All right, Warchick, what's on your mind? I was on Marty Kane's. A guy named Pete Sutro. He owed Kane some money. And you paid off? I paid him a visit. We had something in common. And you must have bored him to death. Kane couldn't quite stand a couple of slugs in his forehead, so he quit. Well, what do you want me to do, Warchick? Break the news to his wife? No. Just tell me about the argument you had. It was a monologue. Kane wanted to know where Sutro was hiding. 
I only knew one answer, so he did all the talking. Oh, you should have said, please. It's not polite to interrupt a guy with a gun. Look, Warchick, what makes me the blue plate special? The motel manager. He said you go into Kane's room, and then he heard a struggle, and then later on he heard a shot. Did he hear who won the fourth? Listen, copper, a guy named Nat Finley hired me to find out who Pete Sutro was. The name was playing tag in his brain all week, and he wanted to know why. Yeah, does that sound like a story? Check with Finley. He's the guy who made it up. What if he lets you down? And work on his wife. She's not bad looking, and she paid me to drop Finley's account. I'll check both your alibis, Manero. In the meantime, I want to line you up. While you're making your rounds, look up a gal named Evelyn Day. She knew Sutro, too. Go ahead. Run the police force. Tell me what to ask her. Forget it, Ward. You're not the type. Ward stood there for a second, wiping his teeth with his tongue. If he'd done it on the outside, it would have been a contract job. And then one of the bowlers in a tight pair of slacks brushed up against him and went out. He looked at me once more and headed after her. Well, I didn't feel much like bowling either, so I left a note at the desk for the girlfriend and started out. I knew I was in trouble. Some days it's harder to duck trouble than a handful of pebbles. No, I told myself I didn't kill Kane, but that was like trying to fight a fire with an anti-smoke law. The big question was Pete Sutro. Who was he? There were other questions. Why why did the Finley dame buy me off? And why did her husband want Sutro in the first place? Well, there were no answers, and I felt about as safe as an alligator walking through a handbag factory, so I looked up the only good guy I know, a waterfront priest named Father Leahy. I found him in his room, flipping through a couple of raffle books. Hello, Johnny. You're just in time to buy a ticket. The boys' club is raffling off an electric toaster. I'm already a little burned, Father. I'm in a spot, Johnny. The boys gave me a quota to fill. I got stuck at a banker's luncheon all afternoon. You know what they're like on risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to sell some tickets. All right, I'll buy a couple, but I need your help. I'm in trouble. You'd better buy five. At a time like this, both of us can afford to be generous. What kind of trouble? This won't take long, Father. You always say that, but it adds up. You don't realize it, but I lose whole weekends that way. Will you please listen, Father? Warcheck wants to pin me down on a murder. You've got the weight. Who's dead? A guy named Marty Keene. I saw him a couple of hours ago, and he was still alive when I left. Can you prove it? Well, that's going to be tough. The clerk at the motel saw me go into Kane's room just before he got tumbled. So far, you don't have a way out. Why not plead insanity? I would, but I'm afraid of the competition. What do you mean? A muddled-up guy named Nat Finley hired me to chase down the name Pete Sutro. He claimed the name was haunting him. I know how he feels. Johnny, I don't think the bishop likes me either. My only lead was Marty Kane. He seemed to want Sutro worse than I did. Sutro is certainly popular for a dream. Do you think he'll ever materialize? I don't know, but I don't think Marty Kane was killed over a dream. If he was, it must have been quite a nightmare. Did you look up your client again? I didn't have the time. His wife paid me to drop the whole job. She said Finley was a harmless duck with a pail full of wild ideas. Does the husband feel the same way about his wife? Do you want gossip, Father, or do you want to help me? That's an unfair question, Johnny. Either way, I'm embarrassed. Please, Father. Will you check up on a few people for me? Yes, yes. Look up Keane's friends, and if you run out of those, try his enemies. Find out who might have had an urge to kill him, will you? It's a tall order, Johnny. There may be a lot of people involved. I can use them all, Father. I know. But can they all use an electric toaster? When I left Father Leahy, I knew I still had one base to tag. It was Sutro's ex-flame, a doll named Evelyn Day. I drove down to Eddy Street and I parked near the Jade Club. Well, it's not a bad place, but on a slow night, even the winos are afraid to go in. Inside, it was dark enough to hide the decimal point on a check, and over by the bar, there was a piano playing music that nobody was listening to. And then Evelyn came out. And right off, he started hunting for the nearest fire exit. She had red hair about this side of 98 degrees, and she wore a black evening gown that held up by one strap and a prayer. She was the kind of a girl who could wear a Mother Hubbard and make it look like a negligee. And when she sang, it came out low enough to strike oil. After she was through, I asked the bartender to give her a message. She walked over to me, and she wasn't happy one way or the other. Are you the man who wanted me? One of them. You're Evelyn, huh? Yeah. What'll it lead to? A crisis, if you don't sit down. All right. You've got me interested. Now, what's on your mind that we can talk about? My name's Madero. Now, let's start with a friend named Pete Sutro. Let's continue. What do you want to know about him? Where is he? Are you a cop, or will you pay for the right answer? I need too many of them, baby. I'm way out ahead in the murder derby, and I'll pitch homicide anybody I can get. What do you want Sutro for? I think he shot Marty Kane. Someone should have. 
But you're betting on the wrong horse. Your prejudice, Sutra was your boyfriend. That's right. He was my boyfriend. But I haven't seen him lately. All right, then. What was the last thing you did with him? <laughs> I'll read my diary to you someday. Now, look, baby, you've got a choice. I'm going to rough you up or let the pros do it. Let go of my arm, Adero. Or I'll call a bouncer. Call Sutro. Now, start talking before I bruise you up good. Go down, Adero. You're out of my weight class. Yeah. I'll tell you what you want to know. Should I take notes or is this going to be quick? I don't know. Depends on how sentimental I get. That's all right. I got a handkerchief. Okay, I'll tell you. I used to be Pete Sutro's girl in Detroit. Then one day he skipped out and left me hanging on the barn. Don't worry, baby. You haven't with it yet. I started looking for him and so did Kane. Why Kane? He and Pete had a deal together. Pete ran out with all the dough. Your boy should have run for Congress. He's got a nice record. What kind of a deal did he have with King? I don't remember. All of a sudden, huh? I'm shy when it comes to strangers. Let's just end it by saying Pete disappeared. Let's say you're dummying up. I love Pete. And I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. Do you carry a picture with that torch, baby? Sure. Want to see? Here's a snapshot of Pete in my locket. Do you know him? Not this season, no. I want him back. He was a good guy. Yeah, your boy worked up a lot of people. He made number one nightmare for a guy named Nat Finley. I heard. And I want to see Finley, too. You saw me, Nat. But I want to talk to Madero. Hello, Finley. I got to see you alone, Madero. And I got to see you now. You lost your option. I'm freelancing again. Well, you can't walk out on me. This is going to hurt, fella. Your wife paid me to drop the job. That's what I got to talk to you about, Madero. I think she wants to drop me, too. <laughs> Finley grabbed me by the arm, and you could tell he was scared. His jaw was shut tighter than a wall safe, and his Adam's apple rode up and down like a yo-yo. Evelyn wanted to compare notes with him on Sucro, but right now Finley was as friendly as a no-limit poker game. He hustled me out of the jade and into a waiting cab. He wouldn't say anything because of the driver. So he sat in one corner, rubbing his hands and looking straight ahead. When we got to the office, Finley paid the bill, and we went up the ramp. Inside, he had a little trouble getting started, like a big family leaving on a picnic. And then he got his voice. I'm in a bad spot, Madero. I need help. Have you tried classifying? I'm trying you. I tell you, my wife's out to get me. She keeps telling me I'm crazy. She's trying to talk me into it. A lot of wives feel that way, Finley. She'll get over it. Yeah? Well, well I, Madero, she's trying to send me to an asylum. She and Sucho. You got enough worries to start a peace conference. What brings Sucho back into the headlines? I, uh, I found a letter in Sheila's purse. Kane wanted $10,000 from Sheila to keep quiet about Sucho. All right, quit prodding me with ghosts. So your wife had a past. And she and Sucho have a future unless... Unless you help me. Help me, I tell you. I tell you, Sutro's behind the whole thing. He and my wife must know each other, and they're trying to get rid of me. You're getting a complex, Finley. Slow down. Well, you've got to help me. Well, who's going to help me? i got a murder rap to beat. Well, but I'll clear you, Madero. I'll clear you if you help me now. You couldn't clear your own throat in an empty tunnel. What makes you eight feet tall? This gun in my hand. Well, stop pointing it, fella. You're too nervous to aim. Well, you don't understand, Madero. I'm not pointing it at you. I'm giving it to you. This is the gun that killed Kane. You were there when it happened? No, but either my wife or Sutro was. When did you dream that up? An hour ago. I found it in my wife's closet. Two slugs are missing, and I, I got a feeling it killed Kane. Send it to homicide. They'll let you know who did it by return mail. I can't, Nadell. I can't just yet. I don't know whether Sheila or Sutro did it. I got a feeling inside. You've got to find Sutro, or you'll end up killing me yet. That's a prediction? Wait a minute. Someone's coming down the hall. Hide the gun, Madero. They're after me now. Yeah. They got the light to Lay low. They're aiming for something bigger. What are you going to do, Madero? Just waiting for something to happen. Oh! Madero. Madero. I guess it happened. Somebody turned a flashlight in my eyes and then hit a four-bagger. If they hung around, they could have seen me do a couple of quick quivers a chorus girl would have been proud of. I laid there in the dark for a while. If you're going to look messy, a blackout isn't a bad place to do it. After a while, I tried to get up, but my stomach felt as empty as a horse laugh at a funeral. I sprawled out again, and I tried to figure how a name like Pete Sutro could start so much pain. Then the lights went on. They should have stayed off, because Warcheck was breathing over me like a steam engine with a broken heart. Hello, Madero. Does the light bother your eyes? Yeah, Warcheck. Get out of it. And get used to it. It's a lot stronger down at headquarters. Uh, tell me about the gun on the floor. I heard you were coming. I wanted to commit suicide. You didn't try hard enough. Just got a phone tip that said you had the gun to kill Marty Kane. Hand it to me. All right, copper, I'll make it easy for you. Finley left the gun here before somebody sapped me. Uh-huh. Who's somebody? 
Don't any of your friends have names? Sure. Check with Finley. He was here when it happened. It was dark, Madero. How did he see? With an electric eye? I don't know. Maybe he smelled his wife's perfume. Look her up, too. He's that interesting, huh? He used to think so. What do you mean? It was blackmailing her. Look, Madero, a grocery list is blackmail to you. I'll put you on the inside. Finley found a letter in her purse. Kane wanted ten grand to keep quiet about Sutro. Finley told you all about it, huh? He can't keep a family secret. And the wife tumbled Kane to keep him quiet. Is that the idea? Well, this is your good day, Warcheck. Find Sutro now, and you've licked the whole thing. No, you find him, Madero, and we'll give you a reward. You're too generous. What's the pitch? Sutro's wanted for a payroll robbery in Detroit. He's been out of sight for a year now. He hasn't been out of mind, though. Finley thinks his wife is carrying on a sideline with him. Look, Madero, I talked to your boy, Finley. He's got enough dreams to start a mattress factory. I don't believe him. I don't believe you. You don't believe the world is round. Take stock, Warcheck, and start learning. Yeah, I will. I will. Let's see how much the fingerprints on this gun teach me. You've got a story? I'll stay after school. You'll still wear the dunce cap. That's all right, Madero. There'll be a badge on it. Warcheck wrapped the gun up in a handkerchief. And if it killed Marty Kane, I might as well start writing letters to the governor. The gun was a plant, but I had about as much chance of selling after Warcheck as a pair of short pants to a reform school. Warcheck stood there and smiled, and then he walked out. Ah, there were a lot of questions again, like who sapped him, and did Finley really have a story? The more I thought about it, the more snarled it got, and then the phone rang. Yeah. Hello, Johnny. This is Father Leahy. Are you still free? Yeah, but I'm breathing hard. How'd you make out? Fine, Johnny. I sold ten raffle tickets. What'd you find out? Warcheck just got a teletype. Sutro pulled a payroll robbery in Detroit. They think Monty Kane helped him. Well, that figures. What else? Sutro and the Doe are supposed to be somewhere in town. Yeah, even the bloodhounds are worried. How does Sheila figure? She and a girl named Evelyn were both in love with Sutro. But rumor has it that Sutro's favorite was Evelyn. What about Finley? Sheila must have got tired of sharecropping, so she settled for Finley. Both came in from Detroit about a year ago. The father, it's still fuzzy. Marty Kane was blackmailing Sheila because of Sutro. There must be a tie. Evelyn's asking the same question, and she thinks Sheila knows the answers. She's on her way to the Finley place for a showdown. Thanks, Father. I'll tag along and grab a seat on the sidelines. It'll be a free-for-all if those two girls tangle. Don't worry, Father. They won't get in my hair. Don't be too sure. Samson had trouble with one girl. <laughs> Father Leahy hung up. All the pieces began to fall into place. All but one. Where was Sutro? He was around somewhere, but it was like throwing a headlock on a shadow. I grabbed a cab out to the Stamford Arms, and when I got there, the doorman looked at me as if I'd just blown up an orphan. I took the elevator and got off on the sixth floor. And then I leaned on the doorbell, and Sheila answered. She was wearing a pair of rose-colored lounging pajamas, and I've seen baked potatoes with lucid jackets. She must have been surprised, but she didn't blink an eyelash. Are you pausing or opposing, Miss Madero? I'm looking for trap doors. Oh, well, if you're going to look that way, come inside. Yeah. Now bring that gleam in your eye over to the fireplace. We'll warm it up a little. It won't look good in company. Why? Who's company? Evelyn's a little late. She got tied up sharpening her claws. Evelyn who? Hold on, baby. She's got a better question than that. Like what? Like where's Pete Sutro? The key sounds like a friend. That's too early. That's probably my husband, Matt. Oh, hello, Madero. I'm glad you're here. Somebody's been following me. Oh, you're dreaming again, darling. You see? What did I tell you? It wasn't a dream. That must be her. Hello, Sheila. Remember me? You, you must have the wrong place, lady. That's the right idea. I want Pete Sutro back. You want too much. I'll grab anyway. I've come for Pete, Sheila. He came too late. He's dead. Pete Sutro died two years ago in Detroit. You hear me? He's dead. Not dead enough. You're lying, Sheila. Pete Sutro is standing right behind you. What do you mean? That's my husband. That's Nat. So you gave him another name and another face. But you can't give him another voice. That's Pete Sutro. What are you talking about? What are you saying? I'm not Pete Sutro. Don't you remember me, Pete? I'm Evelyn. Oh, what did they do to your face, darling? My face? I, I was in an accident. It's, it's hard to remember things. Remember the payroll robbery, Pete? You were supposed to come back to me. Payroll robbery? Yeah, there was an accident. I, I was hurt. I, I can't remember anything else. It, 
It's so hard to think. Well, you, you were there, Sheila. What happened? Go ahead, Sheila. Tell him what happened. Tell him that he's Pete Sutro. Tell him that you stole him from me. Tell him that you killed Marty Kane. All right, Evelyn. I'll tell it to you first. It was a good campaign, but I'm voting you done. Put away now. the gun. He won't stand for it. He's peck now. What are you doing, Sheila? You'll hurt him. I'll try. You, you shot him. You shot Evelyn. Please, you remember me. She, she broke us up for good. But you, you remember me. Yeah. Yeah. I remembered. Evelyn. I'm beginning to remember a lot of things now. Then forget them, Ned. Just you and me now. We're married. You are. You married a guy named Nat Finley. Stay away from me, Nat. Nat! Try Pete. See how it sounds. Let, Give me that gun, baby. Let go. You killed Evelyn. Let go. You didn't need her. Not anymore. I got the gun now. No, please, Nat. Please. Tell me it's a dream, baby. Tell me I'm crazy. You are, Nat. You are. I am getting out of here. You're not quick enough. The gun's empty now. Yeah. So is everything. I'm tired, Madeo. Tired. Hold up. It's going to be a long trip. Yeah. I told you, Madeo. Pete Sutro was going to kill me in the end. Yeah. You talked yourself into it. Warchek got the whole story the next morning. Seems that Sutro and Kane were in a big robbery in Detroit. The plan was for Sutro to carry all the dough and meet Kane and Evelyn at their hideout. But Sutro got smashed up in an auto accident and never made it. Sutro's face had to be remodeled, and when he lost his memory, Sheila made her pitch. She promoted a wedding and cut herself in on half the stolen cash. Changed his name to Nat Finley and brought him out to San Francisco. Kane and Evelyn got wind that Sutro had taken off to the coast, so they followed him. They couldn't find him, and for a year, Sheila and Sutro got along without a hitch. And then Sutro began hearing his real name in his own mind, and before Sheila could do anything, I'd already shown her husband's check to King. He recognized Sutro's handwriting right away, and so he started to blackmail Sheila. He didn't make any yardage because Sheila stopped him with a thirty-eight, And then she tried to convince her husband that he was crazy. Evelyn won in the last round when she recognized Sutro's voice at the jade. Turned out that Sutro had been chasing himself until he caught himself. Well, Warchak asked only one question. How can a guy forget his own name? I don't know. A lot of hotels would like to know that, too. Johnny Madero, Pier 23, starring Jack Webb as Johnny Madero, has been presented by the Mutual Network. Johnny Madero is written by Herb Margulis and Lou Morheim. Gail Gordon played Father Leahy. Bill Conrad played Inspector Warcheck of Homicide. John Garfield Platt played Nat Finley. Others in the cast were Gene Rogers, Joan Banks. Original music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and the entire production was directed by Nat Wolf. Tony LaFrano. This speaks. is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a juvenile detail. For the past two weeks, there have been rumors of a teenage gang war taking place in your city. You don't know when it's going to start. You don't know where. Your job, stop it. Friends, stage and screen star Paul Douglas is featured on the Chesterfield poster of the month that's up all over town. Here's what Paul Douglas says about Chesterfields. Quote, I've been smoking Chesterfield for 22 years. They're best for me. 
If you try them, you'll find they're best for you. Unquote. You know why Chesterfields are best for you. Because they're low in nicotine, highest in quality. And of course, Chesterfields are really mild, really satisfying. Try them yourself today. Regular or king size, Chesterfield. <laughs> Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. Tuesday, September the 8th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of juvenile detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Powers. My name's Friday. We just transported a prisoner from the main jail, and it was 10.39 p.m. when we got to Georgia Street Juvenile. The interview room. Sit down, Angelo. Yeah. What they call you, Angie? Yeah, Angie. Why'd you tell the officers who arrested you that you were 18? How'd they find out different? All they had to do was check your record. I don't make any difference. Some of them say 16, some say 17. They're all different. You're 17, though, aren't you? Yeah, 17. All right, you want to tell us about this burglary? I told the other guys. Ain't that enough? We want to hear it. Well, figure if you tell it once, that's enough. I copped out. I told them all about it. Why don't you ask them? All right, boy. Give us a story. You got a match? You're better if you don't smoke, don't you think? Well, my folks don't care. They let me smoke. The law doesn't until you're 18. Oh, yeah. Come on, Angie. Tell us about it. Nothing to tell. Me and a couple other kids broke into a house. That's all there is to it. We just broke into the place. What about the stuff you took? I told the other two guys all about that. The officers from burglary? Yeah, they said it was from Central. I told them all about it, everything. You show them where the plant was? I told them. I didn't go there, though. I just told them. What'd you steal? Huh? The things you stole. Name them for us. Just different stuff. You know, like you find in a house. All kinds of stuff. Was there an electric mixer? Yeah, a good one. You know, with orange juice attachment. Good. Mm, what else? Electric razor. Some silverware. What kind of silverware? You know, like you eat with. Mm-hmm. Was there a silver tea service? A what? A tea service, you know what I mean? Hey, if I knew, I wouldn't ask you. Like a coffee pot with legs, a lot of scroll work on it, silver, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, was there one of those? No. How about a German Luger? You mean a pistol? That's right. No, there wasn't one of them. Hey, you guys gonna let me out tonight? No, you'll be held here. Well, I thought you was gonna let me go tonight. How about my folks? They know I'm here? We haven't had a chance to notify them yet. Where do they live? Down on Wall. They have a phone? Uh-uh. I thought you always told him when you picked up a kid. You were booked as an adult. Oh, yeah. You fenced any of the stolen merchandise yet? No, we just got it last night. We just broke into the house and haven't had a chance to fence it. The other officers say they're going to pick it up? Yeah. You got a job? What? I said, are you working? I told you I did. Where? Place down on East Fifth. What do you do? I'm a messenger. Ride a bike. Deliver things. You working there now? I'm here now. You know what I mean. No. You're not working then. The boss and me had a beef. He's moody one, too. Real moody. Did a parole officer know you lost the job? I never told him. Well, maybe he found out. Maybe that's why he was sore at you. Yeah. You been reporting regular? Yeah, pretty much. What's that mean? Once in a while, a couple of times I missed. Just a couple. Do I have to make a federal case out of it? My parole officer know about this arrest? I think he's been notified. How many times have you been arrested? I don't know. Maybe six, seven. You ever been to camp? Yeah, I was there. What for? Truancy. How long were you there? A couple of weeks. And I broke out and he sent me to Preston. I'm on parole now. You can't let me out tonight, huh? We'll book you and notify your officer. What's his name? Lockridge. He's a moody old guy. Hope he ain't in the mood when he sees me. Rough if he's in the mood. All right. Yeah. Like he came down to see me one day and asked me how I was doing. I told him fine. I had a job. I was doing fine. He says, that's good, Angie. Like that. That's good. Tells me how fine I'm doing. Yeah. Next day he comes to my house and reads me off. Says I'm a bum. I'm no good. All like that. Moody. Why'd he read you off? I don't know. Didn't he tell you? No, he just came in and yelled at me. I wasn't doing anything. He's moody. You belong to a gang, Angie? Huh? I said, do you belong to a gang? Yeah, we got a club. I belong to that. What's the name of the club? Little Wall Street Gang. You heard of it? No. Good club. You sure you ain't heard of us? No. How about you? No. Your gang fight much? What do you mean, fight? Well, you ever get mixed up in gang wars, anything like that? No, no, not us. We've been in a couple of street fights, maybe. You know, some kids come over to where we are and start trouble, but we've never been in no gang wars. We got a good gang. You know anybody that belongs to Pink Rats? A couple of guys. I don't know them real well. Who are they? I told you, I don't know them real well. Just to know them when I see them, you know, like that. You don't know any of the names, huh? Well, I think one of them's called Pinky. That's all I know. Look, why are you asking me about them? Well, we got a rumble that they're cooking up a gang war. I wondered if you knew anything about it. Where'd you hear it? We did. 
You know anything on it? No. You sure? I told you. I wouldn't tell you if it wasn't right. Now, look, Angie, if this thing breaks loose, there's going to be a lot of kids hurt. If you've got no part in it, why don't you give us a story? I'm giving it to you. Ain't nothing more I can tell you. I didn't hear nothing about no war. I told you, I belong to the little Wall Street gang. We don't get mixed up in no wars. A couple of street fights, maybe, but no wars. You going to stand on that? I haven't gone any other way. What, what did you hear? Huh? What did you hear about the rats? Uh, about the war, I mean. Who are they going to fight? The only way it comes to us, they're going to cut into the orchids. You mean from the south side? Yeah. They're rough guys. That's what we hear. How, how did it start? What do you mean? What's the beef? The orchids won't go that far away from home to stage something. Got to be a reason. You guys know what it is? Well, the way we got it, a girlfriend of one of the orchid gang moved over into the pink rat territory. He started to go with one of the rats. The orchids didn't like it, so they drove over one night and beat up on one of the rats. The next night, the rats went over the south side and kicked around one of the orchids. That's the way it started. A couple of nights ago, one of the rat kids was riding down the street on a motorbike. A car full of orchids came up alongside the boy, and before he could do anything about it, they wrapped a piece of bicycle chain around his head. Kill him? No. He's still in the county hospital. He's not doing too well. We got word there's going to be a party this Saturday night at one of the rats' house. They figure maybe that's where the trouble's going to be. You're not throwing any coconuts in me. What? This is for real? It's the way we get it. Those kids get started, and somebody's going to get hurt real bad. Maybe a lot worse than you got to figure. What do you mean? I heard about the job the orchids did last week. Yeah? They broke into a place and cleaned it out. It must have been for Saturday night. How do you mean? They stole a couple of rifles. Something worse. Yeah? 12 gauge shotgun. 10.45 p.m. Angelo Marcal was rebooked at Georgia Street Juvenile on a charge of burglary. His shoes and his belt were taken from him and he was held in detention. We put in a call to his parole officer and told him what had happened. After that, we drove by Markel's home to inform his parents of the arrest, but we found nobody there. We left our card with a notation asking them to call us when they returned. Before the Markel boy had been placed in the cell, we'd gotten a description of the boy he knew as Pinky. After trying to contact Markel's parents, we went up to the second floor of the juvenile division and had the record bureau check the nickname and description. We came up with three possibles. We pulled the mug shots of the boys and showed them to Angelo Markel, but he was unable to give us an identification. It was difficult to tell if the boy was lying or telling us the truth to try to cover up for the members of the Pink Rat Gang. The following afternoon, Wednesday, September 9th, Frank and I checked into the office and then we drove out to see the parents of the Mark Cowboy. They still hadn't returned, and the neighbors told us that they had seen the couple drive away early Monday morning without giving any indication as to when they might return. We asked the woman who lived next door to call us when they did come back. 4.40 p.m., we drove over to the east side of town to check on the three possibles named Pinky that we'd turned up the previous night. All of the boys were able to prove to our satisfaction that they were not the pinky we were after. We talked to the youngsters in the neighborhood asking them if they knew anything about an expected gang war. Either they didn't know anything about it or they wouldn't tell us. 6.15 p.m. We went back to the office and put in a call to Central Burglary. Yeah. We haven't got the exact date. The way we got it, there are a couple of rifles taken and a 12-gauge shotgun. No, and a 12-gauge shotgun. Yeah. Sure, I'll wait. They're checking the reports now. This is one tip I'd like to have turned bad, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. That'd be the 30, huh? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, I guess it might be. Won't help if it is. Right. Let us know, huh? Right. They got the reports. Guns were stolen on Tuesday, August 30th. They still haven't been able to get anything on it. Rifles were 30 odd sixes. Deer rifles, huh? Yeah. Olson says they got another report last night. Might mean something. Yeah. Hardware store broken into. What'd they take? Four boxes of 30 odd six ammo, three boxes of 12 gauge cartridges. It might have been a coincidence, but if it wasn't, the Orchid gang was armed with three guns and 225 rounds of ammunition, enough to start and sustain a small war. 6.35 p.m., we contacted Lieutenant Hartgrove, the night watch commander, and he assigned two other teams of officers to work with us. In addition to the juvenile officers, radio units out of Metro Division, reserves, joined us in the search for members of the Orchid Gang. The streets in the area were combed. Citizens in the area were questioned, but they failed to supply any information on the boys who belonged to the gang. The satin-embroidered jackets the members of the Orchid Gang wore had disappeared from the streets. At 12.01 a.m., the search was called off, and a broadcast was put out to the regular units in the area to be on the watch for any gang activities. 12.47 a.m., we got in touch with Rex Olson in Central Burglary. He told us that the crime lab had failed to come up with any physical evidence on the theft of ammunition from the hardware store. 1.20 a.m. Frank and I checked out of the office and we went home. The following morning at 8.30 a.m. we got in touch with the juvenile informant and he was able to give us more information on the expected gang war. He told us that the fight was set for Saturday night. 
He was unable to give us the exact address of the party that was to be crashed, but he did give us a general idea of the location. He was also able to give us the name Pinky Eggers and his address. He told us that the Eggers boy was the leader of the Pink Rats and might be able to give us information on the membership of the Orchid Gang. 12.40 p.m., Frank and I drove out to talk to the Eggers boy. We checked his school, but he wasn't there. We went to his home. It was a small one-story frame building with a weathered picket fence surrounding it. A 1947 hopped-up Ford was in the driveway. Frank and I went up on the porch and rang the bell. Yard could sure stand a cleaning up. Yeah. wonder who the car belongs to. I don't know. Sure looks fast. Yeah. Yeah? I'd like to see Pinky Eggers. Who are you? Police officers. Well, can't you lay off the kid? Why don't you quit rousting him? Is he here? No, he ain't here. And if he was, I don't think I'd let you see him. That his car? Yeah, it's his. Registered in his name? No one mine. Now, what are you after the kid for? I want to talk to him. Well, talk to me. I'm his father. Anything you have to say to him, you can tell me. Your boy belonged to a club called the Pink Rat Gang? Why? Does he? I answer no question until you tell me why you're asking. Now, look, mister, we're not out here to pass the time of day. Your boy's mixed up in something that can turn out to be pretty serious. Is that right? That's the way it is. Who says it's serious? And what are you talking about? We got word that your boy's mixed up in a gang war that's going to break out this weekend. And you two big cops are out here leaning on a kid because he's mixed up in a beef. Listen, there's a five-year-old kid down the street skating on the sidewalk. Why don't you go put the arm on her? Well, this war breaks out and somebody's going to get hurt. Maybe you're a boy. We're trying to stop it. Well, don't bother. Pinky can take care of himself. Any of the gangs cause trouble, the rats can swing their end. You want to stop the beef? Go talk to the other kids. Tell them to lay off. My boy's gang is now looking for trouble. Any fighting going on, you can talk to the other kids. You check them. Leave my boy alone. We want to talk to him, Mr. Eggers. You going to make a pinch? No, we just want to talk to him. Should have known you were going to take him today. Only two of you. Well, I'm telling you, you ain't laying a hand on Pink. You try it, and I'll haul you in every court in the country. Now, get out of here. Where's your boy now? That's none of your business. I told you to get out. Maybe you don't understand, Eggers. This is a gang war. Your boy's helping to build it. All right, so a couple of kids get together in a vacant lot and mix it up. A couple of bloody noses, black eyes, nothing wrong. Makes men on them. A lot more serious than that. We understand there's going to be guns used in it. You get out of here now. I got some rights. You went off the property in two minutes flat, I'm going to get a gun and start shooting. You come around here telling me my son's getting mixed up with a bunch of hoodlums using guns? You guys are Section 8s. Maybe Pinky will belt a couple of kids, but there ain't going to be no guns. Only reason they'd use them is that they're around all the time with you cops hounding them. You just can't see a bunch of kids have a little fun, can you? Unless they belong to the stinking clubs you build, you can't stand on that D-A-P-S or whatever you call it. Kid don't belong to that, ain't no good in your book. Well, I'm telling you something. Any kid that does belong to it's a bum in my book. Now, you get off my property and don't come back, you hear me? Anything happens, Pinky can take care of himself. He'll be okay. Now, you guys leave him alone. I hope he's right. <laughs> p.m., Frank and I drove over to Pinky Eggers' school again. We spent the next two hours talking to the youngsters in the neighborhood. Those that would cooperate with us didn't have the information that we needed. The others refused to tell us anything. In the meantime, officers from 77th Street Division were checking on the activities of the Orchid Gang. They ran into the same evasive answers that we had. If the information we'd gotten was true, we had a little more than 48 hours to find the principals in the war before the shooting could start. Thursday night, 8.40 p.m., Frank and I met with Captain John Powers, Lieutenant Hartgrove, and the heads of the juvenile details throughout the city. From them, we learned that word of the impending war had spread through the gangs in the separate districts, and that the other gangs were taking sides in the argument and were ready to start their own battles with factions who opposed them. Captain Powers, along with the heads of the divisions, mapped the plan of action to be put into effect at the first sign of an outbreak. Additional cars from Metropolitan Division Reserves were to be ready if they were needed. Days off for all juvenile officers were canceled. A three-way radio contact would be kept open between all divisions on Saturday night. The area where the main activity was expected would be heavily patrolled, both by beat men and by radio car officers. Once the operating plan was set up, there was little to do but wait. In the meantime, the search went on for members of the Orchid Gang and for Pinky Eggers, the leader of the Pink Rats. A watch had been placed on his home, but he'd failed to return. Friday, September 6th, 9.42 p.m., Frank and I checked with the burglary division on the stolen guns, then we went over to the New Yorker restaurant to get something to eat. Hi, Sal. Hey, Joe, call your office. I just called you. Yeah, thanks. Order me the fish and chips, will you, Frank? Sure. How's it going, Sal? Not bad. With you? Kind of rough. Where's Rosie? Her and the kids went to movies. Two, five, six, eight, please. Yeah, George Juvenile. Right. Lieutenant, it's Friday. Well, when did it happen? Well, we'll get a pencil. 
So, hand me that menu, will you? Yeah. Here you are. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Well, what do you want us to do? Yeah. They know yet? Yeah, all right. No, we'll get right over there. Bye. Never mind the food, Sal. What's the matter? Kids didn't wait until Saturday. They just shot up Highland Park. What's the score? Still coming in. A good start. Yeah. 11-year-old boy killed. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. It's taking place at your dealers. Cigarette dealers, coast to coast. Smokers by the thousands are now changing to Chesterfield. Join them today, and you'll be smoking the only cigarette that gives you proof of low nicotine, highest quality. I want you to know that's a matter of record, and so is this. As I've been telling you, Chesterfield is the only cigarette with this proven record with smokers. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. Good reasons why you should change to Chesterfield? You bet. Ask for Chesterfield. Regular or king size, best for you. The first victim of the juvenile gang war was 11-year-old Tony Herman. The teenagers next door to the Herman house were having a party. At 9.36 p.m. Friday night, a group of youngsters had arrived at the house and tried to crash the party. A fist fight had ensued, and Tony, who was doing his homework next door, had gone out to see what was causing the disturbance. As he stood on the porch watching the fighting, a 12-gauge shotgun had been fired. The pellets from the cartridge had caught the youngster in the stomach and the abdomen, and he'd gone down. At the sound of the shot, the fighting had stopped, and the party crashers had left the scene. The police had been called, and Tony was removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. He was dead on arrival. From the neighbors, descriptions of the party crashers had been obtained. All of the boys wore satin jackets with a large white orchid embroidered on the back. One of the people who saw the shooting said that the boy who'd fired the gun wore a jacket with the name Gene under the orchid design. A broadcast was gotten out immediately, along with a description of the car that the juveniles had used to escape. The parents of the Herman boy were not at home when the shooting occurred. From the neighbors, we found that they usually went to a movie on Friday night, and they didn't return until after midnight. An officer was stationed at the house to bring them to the hospital when he returned. At 1.34 a.m., Mrs. Herman arrived at the hospital. She was a small, dark woman with graying hair. She didn't know what had happened. Frank and I met her in the hall. I want to see Sergeant Friday. Is he here? I'm Sergeant Friday, ma'am. Well, I'm Mrs. Herman. They say something's happened to Tony. Yes, ma'am. You want to step in here? Might be a little better to talk. All right. Can I see him? He isn't hurt bad, is he? that bicycle. I told his father I knew it was too soon for it. He's so little, and to buy him a big bike like that, he couldn't hardly reach the pedals. Well, that's it, isn't it? He fell off the bicycle. No, ma'am. What is it, then? What is it? Something more? He's hurt. I want to see him. Just a minute, Miss Herman. Why won't you tell me what happened to him? My husband will be here in a few minutes, and he's going to want to know. Why won't you tell me? How bad's he hurt? Pretty bad, ma'am. That's not an answer. How bad's he hurt? He's dead. Dead? Can we get you anything? My boy's dead? Tony? What? But he'd fallen off the bicycle. He got it for his birthday. A new bicycle. 28-inch wheels. I thought he'd fallen. I didn't know it was like this. Can I see him? My boy, can I? Yes, ma'am. How'd it happen? How? Oh, we're sorry about it, Miss Herman. My Tony had an accident and he's dead. He went to a movie and we come home to find our son's dead. Better get the doctor, Frank. Right. <laughs> doctor will be here in a minute, Miss Herman. Just too movie. He's doing his homework. Now he's dead. How did it happen, Mr. Friday? The gun went off. He was standing on the porch. He was hit. But who was shooting? Who shot my boy? Who killed him? We don't know, Miss Herman. I want to know who it was who killed him. I want to know. His father's going to want to know. My boy's dead. My boy, my son. You want to handle the stock? We'll wait outside. Surely. Kind of hard to do. You're going to make up for it, huh? The kid that fired the gun? Yeah. They got him downstairs. A 
few minutes after the broadcast had gone out on the boy wearing the jacket with the name Gene on it, two officers on York Boulevard had picked up the speeding car. In shaking down the occupants and the car itself, they'd found the jacket hidden under the rear seat. In the trunk of the automobile, they'd found the stolen rifles and the shotgun with one discharged cartridge in it. The three boys in the car had been taken into custody and brought immediately to Georgia Street. Two of the youngsters had been taken to the detention cells, and the third, who identified himself as Gene Graff, was brought to the office of the night watch commander. From the identification found in his pockets, we learned his name, address, and his age, 16 years old. His parents were notified that he was being held, and they were asked to come to the office immediately. All the time the boy had been in the room, and the calls had been made, he refused to say anything. When Frank hung up the phone after calling his parents, he made the first statement. What's that going to prove? What's that? Having him come down here, what are you going to prove with that? You want to tell us about it? That's a kid. You going to be all right? No, he's not. How bad's he hurt? He's dead. Rough. That's all you got to say? What do you want me to say? You gunned down an 11-year-old boy and that's all you got to say about it? Look, cop, I know the routine. You read me off, make a big speech, and I'm supposed to feel real bad. Well, I'd like to go along with you, but it won't work. Look, save the effort. Use the words in somebody else. Do what you're going to do and let's get it over with. How old are you? You already saw it. How old? Sixteen. Pretty heavy, aren't you? I've been around, yeah. Don't get smart, kid. Not my fault. I was born that way. How many times have you been arrested? Couple. How many times? Four. For what? Suspicion 211, suspicion 245. You're 16. You've been picked up for robbery and assault. I didn't stand any of them. You ever been in camp? No. You ever served any time? Look, the taxpayers pay you a lot of money to keep records. Why don't you look all this up? It's there. Where'd you get the shotgun you used tonight? I won it in a raffle. I got a lot of luck. Yeah, well, it just ran out, kid. Now, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. If you're as smart as I think you are, you're going to take it. You start answering these questions, you start answering them right. You bought yourself a pile of trouble that you and that smart mouth of yours aren't going to talk your way out of. You killed somebody, an 11-year-old boy. You walked up that house with a gun, a gun you were ready to use. And you just answered the questions and never mind the sarcasm. Put the muscle away. You lean on me and I'll have every sister in this state on your neck. I'm a juvenile, don't you forget it. You just got out of that league. That's the way you see it. That's the way it is. From where you sit. But I'm telling you, you give me any muscle and I'll scream my head off to every sob sister club in the country. I want to ask you once more, young fellow. Where'd you get that gun? I bought a lucky ticket. Stick with it, kid. We're checking the numbers now. Those guns were taken on the burglary last week. You're dead on it. We got you going in. You try to make it stick. Don't worry. We will. Use narcotics? Do I look like a hype? I asked you a question. And I gave you an answer. You drink? Sure. I'm a real lush. I'm going to tell you something. We're running out of patience with you. Well, then you better go get pumped up. You're going to need a lot more. What were you doing out there tonight? Where? Come off it. You know what I mean. Gently, gently. What were you doing at that party? What do you usually do at a party? I was having a good time. Why'd you take that gun with you? It was in the car. I didn't take it. I went along for the ride. Well, who put it there? I don't know. Other boys say it was yours. That's a lie. Prove it. I don't have to. you got to prove I did know about we it. We don't have to prove a thing. There are a couple of people who saw you shoot the kid. Guys who were with it copped out. You're nailed and you know it. We'll see what the judge has to say about it. I've gotten off before. I'll swing it this time. I'm a juvenile. I'm not responsible for what I do. You really believe that, don't you? I said it. You know, I got two kids. What do you want, a medal? I got two kids. They're pretty good youngsters, too. They go to school, they study hard, and they're trying hard to grow up to be decent human beings. They'll get married and raise ordinary families. They'll never do much of anything special to get their names in the papers. Nobody's going to give them much notice. Maybe that's the way they want it. But all of a sudden, somebody like you comes along, mean and rotten, and people hear about you. They figure all the kids sat down and wrote your name on a ballot, and now you represent all of them. That you're the shining example of American youth. They sit there and shake their heads and talk about what's happening to the younger generation. They got the wrong picture. It isn't true. None of it. You framed it. You act like a big man, and every decent, honest kid comes on looking like a bum. You sit there and blow off about being a juvenile. You like it because you think it'll buy you special privileges. Well, you're wrong, fella. Not in my book. As far as I'm concerned, you're a rotten little killer, and you're going to be treated like one. Now you bring out the rubber hose. All right, come on, let's go. Take your coat, boy. You're not coming back this way. Yeah. Come in. Mr. Friday? Yes, Miss Herman. They told me I'd find you here. Is this the boy who did it? Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Answer. Jean Graff. Why'd you do it? Why'd you kill my boy? Did he do something to you? Is that it? Did Tony do something to you? Answer me. Say something. 
Just tell me one thing. What right do you have? What right does a young hoodlum like you have to stand there alive and breathing and my boy dead? What right? Do you hear me? What right? Miss Herman. Make him tell me what right. What right? What right does he have to do a horrible thing like this? What right? I don't know, but we're going to take it away from him. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 4th, a petition was filed in juvenile court and the subject was declared unfit to be tried as a juvenile. He was ordered to be tried in superior court under the general law. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we've been getting letters from people all over the country telling us that they've switched to Chesterfield. Now, just as I've been telling you, thousands of smokers are changing to Chesterfield because only Chesterfield gives proof of low nicotine, highest quality. That's why I recommend you try them today. Regular or king size, Chesterfields are really mild, really satisfying. Best for you. Gene Norton Graff was tried and convicted of murder in the second degree. He was referred to the Youth Authority for punishment. Murder in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of from five years to life. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Bert Holland, June Whitley, Gil Stratton. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspaper for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork tip Fatima? It's the smooth smoke with Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Fatima is made and guaranteed by Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. Try Fatima today. John Cameron Swayze and the news tonight on the NBC Radio Network. This one's about Pete Kelly. times than a chin at a barber college. The entrance is just wide enough to handle one at a time, vertical or horizontal. My name's Pete Kelly. 
I play cornet. We start every night about ten, and we play till the last buck is home safe in Lupo's cash register. George Lupo owns the lease. He's a fat, friendly little guy you can always count on for a twenty in exchange for two tens. But that's all right. He lets us play the kind of music we like, and every once in a while, he'll let us duck out to make a couple of phonograph records. All he asks is that we're back in an hour and 15% of the take. Well, last night, Matty Wynn had been after us for two weeks to make another record for him, to fill out one side. Matty ran a two-turntable recording joint in a loft over on Baltimore. During the day, he'd keep busy making two-buck personal records for the folks to send back home to the farm. At night, he'd rope a combo like ours to put out with some Dixie for the local market. We'd already pressed a few for his label under different names. The Spickardsville Sparks, the Grundy Growlers, the KC Cats. Maybe you got one or two in your collection. Hold on to them. They're pure. Well, it was getting on to 11 when I pushed the tempo on the last number in the second set. Lupo glared at us as we hustled out. Packed up our instruments, we piled into a taxi in Red's Erskine Coupe and slammed out for Baltimore Street and Maddie's Loft. All right, all right. Let's keep it light, huh? This is a residential district now. Hold it down, boys, huh? Hold it down. Hey, fellas, quiet down now. Quiet! Pete? Who's that, Red? Looks like Zell. Oh, Pete, I'm so glad I didn't miss you. Yeah, Zelda. I have to... Could I talk to you for a minute, Pete? All right, what's on your mind? Alone? I got a recording date, Zelda. I know, Pete. That's why I came here. We have to get back to 417. A minute, Pete? A half a minute. All right. Okay, Petey, we'll wait upstairs. All right, you guys, let's move. And Pete. Yeah, Red. We don't sound like much out of corn there. Make it snappy, huh? All right. All right, inside, Mo. Okay. Thank you, Pete. All right, come on, Zelda. Don't be mean, Pete. I've had my share of meanness. The way the newspaper. What did you expect? Rave notices for the way you divorced Maddie to marry a hood like Johnny April? I have a right to live my own life. Sure, no matter whose life you kick the shreds doing it. I love Johnny, and he loves me. Of all people, I thought you would understand that you would... Now, look, Zelda. I like a guy named Matty Wynn. In my book, he didn't rate the kind of treatment you dealt him. You like a guy named Matty Wynn? How much do you really know All right, about... Zelda, just funnel this down. Now, what do you want? Matty refuses to see me, please. That figures. I want you to talk to him for me. Saying what? You and Matty, you always got on well together. He may listen to now, you. Now, look, Zelda, I got a job to do. Get to it. Matty's got a record that belongs to me. I want it. What kind of a record? It's, it's a record you and the boys made once. June night. You're beginning to make a lot of sense, Zelda. You'll understand, Pete. Just tell him I... I'll give him anything he wants for the record. You just tell him that, Pete. If you talk to him, maybe he'll... Now, look, let... Zelda, just for the book here. I never liked you much. I know. Pete, I think I... you were grief for Matty from the first day he met you until the day you dealt him the final foul. All right, now, why don't you just leave him alone? For Matty's sake, believe me, Pete, for his sake, I must have that record. And if you're a friend of his, Pete, you'll advise him to give it to me. All right. I don't know what you want with an old disc of mine, but if it's something you need, it's something Maddie's better off without. Maddie? Well, Pete, I've begun to think you've deserted us for the Mount City Blue Lord. I just left Zelda. Of course, the wisest thing any man could do. She's waiting for me downstairs. Why is it, Pete, that we always assume the vulture to be male? Well, she seemed more like a frightened rabbit. Zelda, rabbit? Mink, yes, but never rabbit. All right, Matty, I'll tell you about it after the session, huh? All right, let's get it on the road, huh? Matty, what do you want us to do? Well, you've just got one side to fill. Last time you did me singing the blues, we never did get a good take on Dixieland one step. Okay, all right, come on, guys, let's like each other, huh? Quiet down, quiet down. All right, let's do Dixieland one step. How you want a routine, Pete? Well, let's see, like this. Everybody going in. Nick, plug those brakes solid. Uh, Matt Lock, you take the first little break on clarinet. Yeah. Then, Mo, you take the second and really blow it out, huh? Give me a and everybody in on the first course, huh? Yeah, that's right. And I'll take it for 16. Matt Lock, you take 16, everybody out. Good and bright, huh? Yeah, okay. okay. All right. Ready, Matty? Just a second. Okay, take it on the count, huh? All right, now, here we go. Four, three, two, one.
Well, it's all good, huh? Yeah, it was good for me. Hi, Madlock. Matty? That does it, Pete. All right, you can pack up. I'll see you back at 417, huh? Come on, boys. You stand behind, Pete? Yeah, ten minutes. Leave the Erskine for me, will you, Red? Sure. Look, Pete. You come here to take care of your business. Leave it that way, huh? Don't worry, Red. I aim to. Will you take my horn? Yeah. I'll see you later. All right. Nice, Pete. One solo seems a little long for time, but I think we can get it all on. Look, Matty, I know this is probably none of my business. The papers and her marriage to Johnny April is made sell to everybody's business. Well, she asked me to talk to you about a record. Indeed. An old one of ours, June night? Yeah, June night. I remember it well, Pete. I always considered it a splendid achievement in jazz that should one day become a collector's item. Zelda doesn't know jazz from German measles and cares less, but she said she'd give you anything you want for that record. You can tell Zelda that she can purchase a copy of June Night at Lambert's for 35 cents. Yeah, that's why I don't get it. And if you're fortunate, Pete, you never will. Forgive me, Pete. I don't mean to be sharp with you, but you're young and carefree. Stay that way. And if Zelda should again approach you, take a trip around the world to someplace else but go. All right, Maddie. She asked me to ask you, and I ask. Good night. Good night, Pete. Who wants to know? Hear that, Perry? He wants to know who wants to know. All right, I'll tell you. I want to know. Feel better? Sure, I'm Pete Kelly, but I got a right... And I got a left. Let's ride. Thanks, but I got my own car here. Right now, ours is safer for you. It's bulletproof. Well, I was going to tell him I didn't need a bulletproof car. He showed me the gun. It was a forty-five. I know how to admit it when I'm wrong. So we got into the bulletproof car. During the ride, I cased the two artillerymen. Except for their faces, I'd seen them a couple of times before. At 417, over at Sour Sammy's, at Fat Annie's. The same tightly tailored blue suits, the same long, itchy fingers, and the same razor-edged lips and eyes. Oh, there's hundreds of them around. But they're pretty right, guys. You gotta know how to handle them. Just do as they tell you, and the chances are you won't lose more than one eye. Well, the car glided to a smooth stop in front of the Roxbury Apartments. The private elevator shot us up to the penthouse. My stomach caught up with me as the gunsels pushed me into a living room that was slightly smaller than Swope Park, but less crowded. One man, all shoulders, no hips, and rich black hair, a face that would make Wally Reed cut his throat. He was sitting at a table with earphones on. He was tuning a radio. He glanced once over his shoulder at me. I didn't jump more than 20 yards was Johnny April. Just a minute. I've been listening to something good on the earphones. Here, I'll plug in the speaker for you. Ah, you hear that music? Yeah. Nice reception, huh? Yeah. Just got it. 12-tube superheterodon, Magnavox horn. Pulls in Frisco without static. The best. Drink? No, no thanks. You sure? I'm sure. Canadian import, the best. You sure you want number one? Yeah, Sure. Well, luck. Luck. Yeah, it's good stuff. Got a joke, the best. You know who I am? Yeah. You sure? Sure. What's my name? April. Johnny April. That's right. You know my wife? Your wife? My wife. Yeah? You sure? Yeah. Mrs. April. Don't you know her better than that? Than what? Than Mrs. April? Well, huh? Well, sure. I know her. I, I knew her when she... Well, before she... When she was married to Maddie Wynn? Yeah. But you didn't call her Mrs. Wynn, did you? Well, I... No. What did you call her? By her name? Which is? Zelda. Zelda, that's right. That's all I wanted to fix. Now we both know what we're talking about. Zelda. You understand now? Yeah. That's why I invited you here to talk about Zelda. And why you're bothering her. Oh, you lost me, Mr. April. Not a bad suggestion, but first I want you to tell me what you and Wynn are clubbing Zelda with. You're asking me to play without a cue sheet, Mr. April. I don't even know the tune. Tonight you stopped Zelda on Baltimore Street. You talked to her on a corner. You were saying she was pleading with you. Now, look, Mr. April, you're spinning it backwards. She stopped me, asked me to speak to Wynn. About what? Well, about a record she said belongs to her. What record? Well, it's a record. One that I made for Wynn. It's called... The title... Yeah, I know. This sounds silly, but it's true. Half right, Kelly. Sounds silly because it isn't true. What do you want with Zelda? All right, April. You take it any way you like. All I want from Zelda is distance between us. Now, I got a date to play. Jake, teach him. What are you and Wynn cooking? Nothing. What do you want from Zelda? Nothing, I tell you. Johnny, Johnny, what are you doing? Is this the club who stopped you tonight? 
Yeah, he's the one. How much did Wynn pay April to take Angel off his hands? <laughs> what did he want? Money. Yeah, he said he and Wynn would make trouble for me, for you. What kind of trouble? My divorce, about my divorce. Open it up again unless I paid them. All right. Now, listen to me, Tenhorn. You got luck. You got lots of luck. You should light a candle to your luck. Next time you fill a ditch. This time I only warn you. And these are the warnings on the way. Tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, you go to Union Station. You buy a ticket, east, west, north, or south. You go. You go till the train runs out of the rails. No more room for you in Kansas City. Only in that ditch. You hear me? I hear you. Well, Jake and Perry drove me back to the Erskine. They dropped me on Baltimore. I sat on the curb, my head between my knees... After a while, I felt a little better. I could breathe again. The lights were still on up in Matty's loft. He was probably working on the master. Well, I navigated the long flight of stairs, trying hard to hold back the sudden anger kicking up in me. It wasn't Matty's fault. He'd warned me about Zelda. No use to take it out on him. Well, I went into the loft and made an effort to hold it down. But it was a wasted effort. Matty wouldn't have minded anything I said or did. Matty wasn't even there. Only his body, half covered with a burlap used on the walls to soundproof the joint. He'd been shot once through the head, clawed down enough burlap over himself to make a shroud. I picked up the phone in the office, gave Central a number of Sour Sammy's joint, and waited for Sammy to see if Bonnie Ricketts was under his favorite table. Bonnie Ricketts is the only ex-bootlegger I know who went broke in 1922. He set out to prove that a man could drink his gin without ill effects. But he never set a time limit on the experiment. No, Barney hadn't come in yet to Sour Sammy's. Well, I left word for him, meet me at Fat Annie's place. I started to leave. I hesitated and went back to Matty Wynn, spread a clean handkerchief over his face. I made the street three stairs at a time. I crossed the river, jolted the Erskine down Boulder Road to Fat Annie's place. Seemed like a waste of good singing, but Maggie Jackson was getting ready to do her number. I eased a lone drunk out of a booth, draped him on the edge of the bar, and sat and listened to Maggie. Across the river on the Kansas side That's where Fat Annie and the blues abide Get your music and your chicken fried. Come to fat me. Just pour a pocket full of rock and rise across the river. To the Kansas side And when you get across That great divide Come to Fat I'm just beat, Pete. Right down to my shoes. Yeah, it's a noisy crowd, Maggie. Out-of-town wine buyers with gin chasers. Murder. Yeah, you want a beer? Thanks, Pete. I could use it. All right. Hey, draw two, will you? Barney ain't been in yet, has he? No. You got trouble again, Pete? Where can I buy a new birthday? The stars are ganging up on me. Ain't nothing in that astrology, Pete. Well, there must be some explanation. Yes or no, hot or cold, I catch it. What's the misery this time, Pete? Only that Matty Wynn caught a bullet in the head. No. And if I'm not out of KC by morning, he's going to have company. Look, Maggie, do you remember a disc I cut for Matty? June night? Sure do. Good session. You got a copy of that one? Right on top of the pile. Where? In my room, just down the street a piece. Well, I'd go with you, Maggie, but I don't want to miss Barney. I'll get it for you, Pete. Thanks a lot. Ah, Pete Kelly, noted troubadour, bar of the barrel houses. Hi, Barney. And Maggie Jackson, canary of the cribs. 
I'll be right back, Pete. Thanks, old man. Uh, Petey, I've just suffered a great hurt. No sooner did I set foot in Sour Sammy's joint than Sour Sammy himself came a-grinning and a-smirking to tell me with undisguised glee that you were waiting for me here. He was openly delighted to see me go. Yeah, look, Barney. I was sorely tempted to ignore the message, merely to aggravate Sour Sammy, you understand. But since it was you, Petey, and in distress, I'll warrant, I came on the wings of Mercury. Thanks, Barney. Mercury, a... that's a thought, Petey. We tried ether in our beer, chloroform, and even the tincture of laudanum. Now, uh, what would a soup spoon of mercury do? Uh, no, too risky, unless, of course, one... Barney, listen from... to me, will you? I'm breathing against the clock. Never will I forget Sour Sammy's attitude. And after all, the credit he's given me, too. No, Petey, it proves only one thing. Man is essentially an asocial animal. We band together only because we find it impossible to survive alone. Yeah, I know. But there is no true affection anywhere. Like the wolf, yes, take the wolf, Petey. He too herds, but only in times of want and stress. Yeah. And as soon as he doesn't have to rely upon his fellow wolf for survival, off he goes to prey upon his own. Yes, Petey, like the wolf, man is a lone hunter, hating the herd because he is forced to depend upon it for survival. You all through? Very well, fellow wolf. Johnny April, Barney, do you know him? Oh, yes, yes. Fine gentleman, Johnny April. Never kills on the Sabbath. Well, I can't wait that long. He gives me till morning to get out of town. Foolish man. Right now, you should be navel deep in timetable. Look, I got sucked into this by his wife, Zelda. She asked me to get a record from Matty Wynn that belongs to her. She told April that I'm trying to shake her down. I got worked over and Wynn got a bullet. What's on this record? I don't know. It's just a disc I once made for Matty. It's called June Night. Why did Zelda want it? I don't know. Why did Zelda lie to April? I don't know. Here's the record, Pete. Thanks, Maggie. And who shot Matty? I don't know. Let's save time, Petey. Just tell me what you do know. Well, all I know is that Zelda's after this record, and she doesn't want April to know it. And that's the copy there? Yeah, June night. I thought we maybe we could spin it once, and maybe it'll give us some kind of a message. I'll put it on the phonograph, Pete. Thanks, Maggie. I'll wind it up for you here. All right, listen to it, Mean anything? Nothing. No hidden meanings or codes or ciphers? Nothing there but the music. Tell me, Petey, how are these things made? What? A recording. Well, you record directly onto a round table of soapy wax, and then they dust this wax with graphite, and they dip it in a copper plating tank. From this, they make what they call a mother, or the stamper. And that's what turns out the records that you buy in the store. I see. And the, the wax master, that's always kept in the recording studio? Yeah. 
Well, you've finished a job, Pete. Can anything else be recorded on the master? Well, I suppose you could dub from one master to another, yeah. Petey, when I was a mere lad, my old father told me, when you seek an answer, child, always go to the master. Well, I pointed Barney for the door. We got into the Erskine and jolted back over Boulder Road and across the river. Barney insisted on expanding his wolf-man-herd theory all the way back to Baltimore Street. By the time we reached Matty Wynn's loft, my fangs were on edge. Barney looked away from Wynn's body as we headed for the file room. I yanked open a metal container. It was empty. The master of June night was gone. Yeah, your old father was right, Barney. He also told me the master will always be there for you. Notice the disarranged state of the fires here. All the compartments. Yeah. Whoever came for the master of June night went directly to the right file as you did. Didn't find it there and ransacked the rest of the place. Well, then Maddie hid it, figuring something like this. But where? Let's look around the control room, Peter. Oh, there's no place there to hide a flea. Did you ever read a story called The Purloined Letter by Edgar Allan Poe? Not now, Barney. A wonderful little tale. Now, look, Barney, In some this other... particular story, Petey, a number of detectives were taking a room apart by the seam, searching for a letter. They couldn't find it. And why? Because man is blind, Petey. He never recognizes the truth when his eyes fall on it. Just as our eyes now fall on this peculiar-looking record on the turntable. Yeah. Barney, he wouldn't leave it out just like this. Prove me wrong. Play it. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's listen to it and see. Close enough, Pete. Don't be foolish, Zelda. Put that gun away. Give me the record, Pete. Sure, in exchange for that gun. You'll get what's in the gun. What, you dealt it to Matty? The record here on the turntable all the time, and you broke three nails ripping those files apart? Face the wall. Keep your hands up. Lean against it, both of you. Excuse me, madam, but I just dropped in to make a record for the folks Shut back up. home. Surely. One move, and I'll give it to you in the back. That's my department, Zelda. Johnny. Give me the gun. All right, Zelda. I told you here, I only bought a small piece of your yarn. Now I want the rest of it. I didn't want to involve you, Johnny. I came to pay them off. They killed Matty. See? See there? And I got the gun away from... No good, Zelda. Can't you see his face? He's just run out of mileage and ideas. Listen to this, April. No. No, darling. It's a frame. This... Shut up. All right, Kelly. I'm listening, and it better be good. All right. Here it is. It's all on the record.
is now available on phonograph record. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Red Cross already has allocated more than a million dollars for emergency relief work in the flood-stricken areas of Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, and Oklahoma. The biggest Red Cross job, however, will be rebuilding and refurnishing homes in the flooded areas. Cost of this job will run into the millions, more than present Red Cross resources can provide. That is why President Truman has issued a special appeal to all Americans to contribute generously to a special Red Cross flood fund of at least $5 million. Send all contributions to your local Red Cross chapter. Proceeding was transcribed. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Tonight, one of your old friends is returning to NBC. Yes, there's fun for everyone tonight with Uncle Gildy, that happy, bungling hero of the airwaves, the great Gildersleeve. And later tonight, there's the best in recorded music on Meredith Wilson's music room. Meredith's special guest this evening is Frank Lesser, the composer of Broadway's musical Guys and Dolls. And make a note to hear Dragnet tomorrow with another authentic story from the files of the Los Angeles Police Department. The Great Gildersleeve, tonight on NBC. Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. Three holdup men have robbed and beaten two supermarket operators in your city. You've got a good description of the thieves. Your job, get them. It was Tuesday, November 3rd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss, chief of detectives, Thad Brown. My name's Friday. We'd gotten a hot shot call about a robbery, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to the corner of Lockwood and Barton Avenues. The Lockton Market. Officer back there. Yeah. Friday and Smith, Central Robbery. Oh, yeah, I'm Jackson, Unit 387. You answered the call? Yeah, we got here a couple of minutes ago. Where's the victim? Back room there. He's pretty bad off. Ambulance attendant's with him now. Mm Mm-hmm. My partner's checking the neighborhood. If there's nothing you need me for, I'll give him a hand. Yeah, make a 211 report for you, Lee, will you? Right. Thank you. Looks like there was quite a fight. Yeah, stuff all over the place. Come on. What do you got in that bottle? It sure stinks. Yeah, you got to clean up these cuts. Let's try to hold still, huh? Ow! Hey, take it easy, huh? Yeah, something you want? We're out of central robbery. Is this the victim? Yeah, a couple of cuts, nothing serious. Tell him about Andy. He's the one who really got it. Who's Andy? The other clerk. Pretty rough. Looks like it might be a fractured jaw. He's in the truck now. Right, let me get this tape on you now, huh? Oh. That should do it. Might be a good idea if you saw your doctor. Yeah, what about Andy? Uh, we're going to take him down to Georgia Street receiving. You're going to call me and let me know about him? Uh, it might be better if you called them. Yeah, okay. Oh, I see you guys, huh? Yeah, right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah sure. Boy, that one guy really clouded me. Hurt. Mm-hmm. What if you feel up to telling us what happened here? Three of them. Three. He came in and held up the place. Clouded me and Andy. Sure hope he's going to be all right. What's your name, sir? Cliff Hall. You own the store, do you? No, me and Andy run it, though. We'd like to buy it. What time did these men come in? Must have been around 9.30, around in there. Did you give the officers who answered the call a description of the men? Yeah, that was the first thing they asked me. Go ahead, please. I was getting the money ready for the bank deposit. Andy was back here stacking bottle cases. These three guys came in. First off, I thought they were customers. Yeah. A couple of them walked to the back of the place. I thought they were picking out stuff. The other one kind of stood around by the cash register where I was. Go ahead. Well, after he was there for a minute, and I see the other two aren't picking up nothing, I asked him if there was something I could get for him. That's when he pulled out a gun. What about the other two? Oh, it worked like they had some kind of signal. As soon as the one in front pulled his gun, the other two did too. The fellow asked me to put all the money in a paper bag. Got the bag from up in front there. Took it right out of the stack and handed it to me. Said for me to put the dough in it. You recall his exact words? What? The way he said it, the words he used. You recall them? Let me see. I think it was, put all the dough in this bag. Don't say anything. Just do as I say. That was the way he said. What'd you do then? Like he said. He had that gun pointed right at me. I could see the other two guys. I wasn't going to do anything but what he told me. I put the money in the bag. Mm-hmm. 
I thought they'd leave the place, but that's when Andy came out. I guess he wondered what the other two were after. You see, from where he was, he couldn't see the guns. Oh. He walked out to them, asked if there was anything special they were looking for. Mm-hmm. What happened then? Well, then he saw what was happening. He saw the guns, and he tried to throw the guys out. I don't know why he did it. Andy's like that. He gets an idea in his head, and there isn't anything that'll shake it loose. He tied into those two guys, almost had him whipped, too, even with the guns. The guy that was with me saw what was going on, he yelled back at him, told him not to shoot. He ran back and laid his gun alongside Andy's head. Oh, clouded him right along in here. Mm-hmm. Andy dropped like a sack of potatoes, and the three guys ran out of the store. How much money did they get, you know? Uh, I hadn't finished up with a bank statement yet. I'd just be guessing, but I'd say about $8,000. Might run to eight five, but that's about it. I see. Well, if you could just give us a description of the man. All three of them? If you could, yeah. The one who was with me must have been about 5'11". Kind of dark complected. Had straight black hair. What color were his eyes? Brown. You have any marks or scars you could see? No. Clean shaven? Yeah, I had a real dark beard. Looked kind of like he had some kind of talcum powder on. Do you remember how he was dressed? Let's see. A dark blue suit, gray top coat, gray hat. Was he wearing a tie, do you know? Yeah, a gray tie with maroon stripes. You know, kind of diagonal, a thin tie. Anything unusual about him? Make it easier for us to identify him? No, I don't think so. How about the gun he was carrying? What kind was it? I couldn't see the name. No, so I mean, was it an automatic or revolver? Oh, an automatic. Looked like a big caliber, I'd say forty five. One of the other fellows had a revolver, but the guy with me in the small one had automatics. You know if they drove a car? Well, if they did, I didn't see it. Might have had it parked right out in front, for all I know. I told you, I was busy when they came in. When they left, I was too worried about Andy to pay any attention to him. Boy, they hit him. A terrible thing. Right along here. Oh, excuse me a minute. I got some aspirin here in the door. Yes, sir. Your hope Andy's going to be all right. We've been together a long time. Can't get over that little guy, the one who hit me. I should have taken him. But the big one, he's a tough-looking, a real fighter. Well, this is going to help much. Huh? He's going to lose this one. We got the descriptions of the other two men, and a supplementary local broadcast was gotten out. The two officers who'd answered the call found a woman in the neighborhood who'd seen three men leave the vicinity immediately after the robbery. She said that she was parked in a car half a block from the store on the same side of the street. She explained that about 9.20 a.m., a car had pulled into a parking place in front of her. She'd seen three men leave the car and walk down the sidewalk in the direction of the Lockton Market. About ten minutes later, the men came back to the car. They appeared to be in a hurry. One of the men was upset and arguing with the other two. She told the officers that they'd gotten into the car and driven off toward Hollywood Boulevard. We asked her to describe the three men. The description she gave us matched the one we'd gotten of the thieves. She gave us a description of the car, and another supplementary broadcast was put out. We asked her to come down to the city hall to go through the mud books to see if she could give us a positive identification. The report from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital indicated that the victim of the slugging, Andrew Rich, was suffering from a fractured jaw and a concussion. He was given emergency treatment and removed to the county hospital. The crime lab crew came out and they went over the store for physical evidence. They were able to lift three partial fingerprints from the counter next to the cash register. Dean Bergman and Leighton Prince explained that the partials were not enough for identification, but that if we apprehended the holdup man, he'd be able to tell us if they'd left the impressions. 10.27 a.m., we took the victim, Clifford Hall, and the woman who'd seen the car to the mug room. They went through the mug books, but they were unable to come up with an identification. We had the stats office make a run on the M.O., they came back with a list of 17 names of men who at one time or another had used the same method of operation. The list was split, and Sergeants Meade and Leitner worked with us in checking the names out. Thursday, 3.48 p.m., Frank and I got to the sixth name on our list. Jerry Evans from that, right? Yeah. Sure dark in this hall. He ought to wash the windows, let some light in. Yeah, here we are. Why not be in? Yeah, we'll try it again. Now let's talk to the manager. Yeah. Yeah? Who is it? Manager, we want to see you a minute. Mr. Man. What do you want? I'm asleep. Come on, Edison, open up. Yeah, we can get out of here. Police officer. Come on, come on. Watch the job. Come on. All right, come on, Edison, get up. What are you doing, I'm going? Look, you got no right to come busting in here like this. Yeah, you're so clean. What are you putting that trouble for? I got scared, that's all. I just got scared. Well, how'd you feel if somebody woke you up and then shoves their way into your room? You, you ain't gonna stand around and just let them do it. Hey, clean job. I told you that. Look, I, I got no trouble I don't want none. You check with Galloway, he'll tell you. I'm home every night at 9 o'clock, every night. Where were you this morning? Huh? This morning, where were you? 
What time? You just tell us what you did starting when he got up. I was up all night. I, I got a virus or something. I couldn't sleep. Take a look there in the dresser. You can see the stuff I've been taking. I haven't been out of this room, not for a couple of days. Can you prove that? Why? Can you? No, there wasn't anybody here. You get any phone calls? No. I don't know what this is all about, but you guys are leaning on me for nothing. Now, you talk to Galloway. He'll tell you I've been working. Well, look here, I'll show Where you. Where you going? I just want to show you something I got in the drawer. Well, you stay right there. I'll get it for you. Okay, I got nothing to hide. Take a look in the top drawer there, left-hand side. Yeah. Please, what you mean? Yeah, that's it. I'll take the rubber band off and look. You'll see I'm telling you the truth. Now, you see? It's all the check receipts I've gotten from where I work. You, you look at them. I'm working every day, and I'm home at night, oh, 9 o'clock every night. How about it, Joe? Yeah. Now, you see? You haven't been out of this room all day, huh? Not a minute. Now, come on, what's all this about, anyway? What are you guys after? We figured maybe you could tell us. Yeah? Oh, I'm sorry. Without you telling me what you want, there's nothing I can give you. You see any of the boys anymore? You mean the fellas I knew before I fell? That's right. Not if I can help it. I'm trying to stay away from them. See any of them lately? Yeah. Saw Alex a couple of days ago. Alex? Yeah. Alex Finley. I knew him when I was up in Q. He came in where I was working. Did you talk to him at all? All right. Just said hello. Passed a couple of minutes talking about some of the guys we knew. See in the rackets now? I don't know. Is he on parole? Yeah, I think so. Did he give you anything? Oh, a couple of rumbles, but if I turn them over to you, I don't want to credit for them. You don't know where you got them. All right. Alex tells me there's a gang that's going to start working here in town, market jobs. How many men? Well, from what Alex says, there's four all heady guys. Finley with him? No, I don't think so. He told it to me that he just heard it. Did he say anything about who the four men are? No, I don't think he knew. He just said they were heavy and they were starting to work. You know where we can get in touch with Alex? No. Well, you might check with Galloway at the parole office. He might have it. Yeah, we will. I'll probably see him again. I'll, I'll try to get the information if I can. Well, what is it? What does he want to know? Who the guys are? That's right. Okay. Now, like I told you, though, I, I don't want any credit for it. I'm in real trouble if it gets around that I'm playing footsie with you. Yeah, sure. I'll try to find out when they're going to start working, too. Well, don't you worry about that. Huh? We already know that. 4.10 p.m. We got in touch with Fred Galloway at the state adult parole offices, and we checked on Jerry Evanston. From what the record showed, the story Evanston had told us was true. His parole officer had reported him working and apparently living up to the conditions of his release. We left him one of our cards and asked him to call us in the event he heard from Alex Finley. 4.21 p.m. We checked back into the office, and we met with Sergeants Meade and Leitner. They told us that they'd checked out the names on their half of the list without result. We sent a teletype up to George Brett in CII Sacramento, giving him the description of the holdup men and listing the M.O. that they'd used. We asked him to run the information through their files and forward any information they came up with. 5.19 p.m. We went out to get something to eat, and then we checked back into the office. Good dinner, huh, Joe? Yeah. I never saw a guy could eat so many enchiladas as you. Yeah, I can't help it. To get started on them, can't seem to stop. Yeah. You got any soda in your locker? No, you got trouble again? You know I always do when we have enchiladas. You ought to remember that when you order a half a dozen. I suppose so. Yeah. I get it. Robbery Friday, yep. Yeah. When was that? They're pretty sure, are they? Has the lab been called yet? Yep. Okay. Right, thanks. Oh, that's a break. Yeah. They just found the getaway car. Six forty seven PM. We left the office and drove out to where the car had been found. It was parked on Lockwood Avenue, five blocks from the market that had been robbed. The radio car officers who spotted it had called the office immediately when they saw a brown paper bag in the back seat bearing the printed name Lockton Market. A crew from Leighton Prince came out and went over the car. They were able to come up with a single print from a man's index finger. Bergman compared it with the parcels found at the market. They matched. We checked the white slip on the car and found that the vehicle was stolen. The report on it had been filed at 10.37 a.m. that morning. We talked with the people in the immediate vicinity, but none of them were able to tell us anything about the people who had parked the car. However, we did come up with an elderly man who told us that he'd seen three men get into another car at about 9.45 that morning. He said that he remembered it because the driver of the car had pulled into a parking space and stopped the motor. Another automobile had parked directly in front of the car, and the driver of the first machine had moved so that there was no one in front of him. The man went on to say that a few minutes after the driver pulled into the second parking place, three men had come around the corner, gotten into the car, and the four of them had driven off. The witness was unable to give us a description of the car other than to say that it was a late model Plymouth or Ford. The only description he could give us of the men was that one of them was large and was wearing a gray top coat and a hat, and that one of them was small. 8.40 p.m. Frank and I went back to the office and checked out for the night. 
The following morning at 8.02 a.m., I checked back in for work. Hi, Joe. Good morning. Kind of cold out. Yeah. You look happy this morning. I didn't sleep a wink last night, Joe. Not a wink. What's the matter? Stomach. Next time I even think about eating enchiladas, stop me, will you, Joe? Yeah, sure. Any mail come in? I don't know. I just got in. There's an ad here from that store over on West 6. They're having their annual sale. Yeah? I want to try to get over there. I'd like to get me a new suit for Christmas. Yeah, there's a special delivery from Burton. Huh. Probably those mugs we asked for. I'll see. Yeah, there's six of them. You want to get in touch with Cliff Hall? We can drive over and have him take a look at them. Yeah. You got any other pictures? Yeah, we can mix them up. I'll call Hall. Okay. I sure hope we get an eye, Dent. We haven't got much to go on. Well, there's got to be a break someplace. We've got to find it. From what Finley said about the gang starting up operation, doesn't sound like just one job. No. They start on a string, they can do a lot of damage. No, it doesn't give us much choice, does it? No. We've got to get to them. 8.27 a.m. Frank and I left the office and drove over to talk to the victim, Cliff Hall. We showed him the mug shots George Brereton had sent us. He picked one out and said that he was positive that the man in the picture was the one who'd held him up. The name on the mug shot was Harold Bishop. According to the record Brereton had sent us, Bishop had been convicted twice on violation of 211 PC, armed robbery. 9.20 a.m. We drove over to the county hospital and showed the pictures to the other victim, Andrew Rich. He picked the mug shot of Bishop as a suspect who'd robbed and beaten him. The notation on Bishop's picture gave us the information that he was on parole at the time. We returned to the office and put in a call to Fred Galloway at the state adult parole office. Yeah, Fred, this is Joe Friday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fine. We'd like some information on a Harold Bishop. San Francisco number 82609. 26, that's right. Male, white, Caucasian. We got a mug from Braden. No, he says he's on parole. Yeah, if you will. Thanks a lot. He's checking the master file now. Me and Lightner are standing by if we need him. When we get this address, we're going to have to move fast. Yeah. Yeah, Fred. When was that? Well, how's his report there? I see. No, I don't know. Yeah, I suppose. Right, Fred. Thank you. Well, you can tell Mead and Lightner to relax. Bishop's got an out-of-state parole. He's living over in Phoenix. Well, he still could be getting into California. No, not likely. Huh? Fred checked with his parole officer. Yeah. He's got a job, and he's been reporting to his parole officer every month. We asked Fred Galloway at the state parole office to contact Bishop's parole officer in Phoenix and check him closely. The report came back that the suspect had a job with a small contractor and that he'd been working regularly. He'd also been giving monthly reports to his officer. We'd had a suspect identified by two of his victims, and yet if the information we'd gotten was correct, it would have been a physical impossibility for him to have committed the robbery. We got a copy of his jacket and looked over his past record. We found that Bishop had been arrested for armed robbery the first time 18 years previously. He'd been brought to trial and acquitted. The next arrest was 10 months after his trial. He'd been convicted and served six years at San Quentin. He'd been released, and within six months, Bishop had been picked up again. This time, he was sent to Folsom Penitentiary. While he was there, he appeared to be a model prisoner, and after serving four and a half years, he'd been placed on parole. After leaving the prison, he'd requested and he'd been granted an out-of-state leave. In checking Bishop's M.O., we found that it matched exactly that of the thieves who'd held up the Lockton market. The time of approach was the same. The number of men used was the same. The method of leaving the scene was exact. We had a suspect, and yet he couldn't have committed the crime. Three weeks passed. On Saturday, November 26th, the thieves hit again. In checking with the victims, they identified the mugshot of Bishop. We put in a long-distance call to the Phoenix Police Department and asked them to check on the suspect. We got word back that he was in their city. They told us that he wasn't at work due to a virus infection. They went on to say that they checked with his landlady and that she told them that Bishop hadn't left his apartment at all on the day of the theft. Monday, November 28th, we got our first break in the case. I'll get it. Robbery, Smith. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Jerry. Uh-huh. You sure about that? Where? Uh-huh. How about the rest of them? Yeah, just a minute. Toss me that pad with you. Yeah, here you go. Okay, Jerry. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you spell it? L-A-L-E-A-H-Y? Uh-huh, I got it. Mm-hmm. 
know the address? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jerry. We'll get in touch with you. Right. Jerry Evanson. Remember the guy we talked to over on South 7? Yeah. Well, the way he tells it, we aren't too far off. What do you mean? He saw Bishop in town last Saturday. We put in a call and we found that there were two major airlines with flights to Phoenix. The flight time they listed was one hour and 35 minutes by air. If Bishop caught the last flight leaving Phoenix, he could arrive in Los Angeles at 11.20 p.m. the night before he planned to commit a robbery. The next day after the holdup, he could catch a plane from the Los Angeles International Airport that would have him back in Phoenix at 8.25 p.m. By doing this, he would be absent from his work only one day, and he could schedule his flight so as not to hit on the days when he had an interview with his parole officer. Tuesday, November 29th, a meeting was held in Chief Thad Brown's office. It was decided to put a special stake out on the airport and wait for the suspect to come into town. At that time, he'd be followed and taken into custody as he prepared to commit another robbery. The names of the three other men Jerry Evanson had given Frank as having been involved in the holdups had been checked through R&I. All three of them had arrest records. Surveillances were placed on their homes, and they were kept under constant watch. Monday, December 12th, 11.15 p.m., Frank and I relieved the stake out at the airport. There's a bench over there. We can keep all the gates in view. Yeah. wonder when he's going to hit again. I don't know. The last couple of weeks have sure dragged by, haven't they? Yeah. Anything on the other three guys? Well, I talked to Pinky Mead this morning. He and Lightner staked out at Lay's apartment. How they doing? Nothing. They parked in the car down the street. And what they say, Lay's like a clock. He comes in at 5 a.m., leaves at 9 p.m. every day. <laughs> you got a cigarette? Yeah. Here you go. Thanks. Joe. Yeah. Bishop. Let's let him get outside. Yeah. wonder if he's got any luggage. Let me bring it up outside. We can wait for him there. All right, come on. You see him? Yeah, there he is. Getting into that cab. Come on. Frank and I got in our car and followed the cab taken by the suspect. We followed him out of the airport grounds and then up La Brea Avenue. The cab turned right on Washington Boulevard and headed for downtown Los Angeles. We pulled up to a stoplight. Still got him? Yeah, he's still up ahead. In front of that blue mercury. See him? Yeah. You got the number of the cab? Mm-hmm. 2974. There's the light. All right, let's go. Better try to pick it up a little, Frank. Cab's pulling away from us. Yeah. Think he's seen us? No. Can't you close in a little? Traffic's too heavy. Can't use a siren. We'll trip him. Yeah. Still see him? Yeah. There's a break. Guy ahead's making a right turn. Now we're right behind the cab. Yeah. I'll close in now. Good. Watch it, Frank. That guy pulling out of the alley. Hold on. As we drove down the street after the stoplight had changed, the car had failed to make a boulevard stop coming out of an alley, and we'd hit it broadside. The damage done to both cars was considerable, and we'd lost our suspect. Frank got to a phone and called the office. He gave them the number of the cab that Bishop was in and asked for a traffic investigation car. The office started a search for the missing suspect. Lieutenant Jack Smyers told us to proceed to the apartment of Tom Leahy to wait for further development. In the meantime, a citywide broadcast went out carrying the description of Bishop and the other three men involved in the theft. Frank and I arrived at the apartment and we relieved Mead and Lightner. We had the manager of the place let us into Leahy's room. We waited. 1.30 a.m., 2.30, 4 o'clock, 5.30 a.m. Frank and I had been on duty for over 21 hours. At 5.45, the phone in the apartment rang once and then it quit. That was the arranged signal between us and the office. Frank put in a call. Lieutenant Smyers told us that officers Max Herman and Ed Benson were on the way out to relieve us. Fifteen minutes later, we heard somebody in the hall. Yeah? Yeah, probably Benson and Herman. Yeah. I get it. Watch it, Look Joe. Out, look out. Give it up, Bishop. You all right, Joe? Yeah, come on. He's going upstairs. Make it for the rope. Come on. You see him? No. You want to take that side? Right. Watch it. Behind the elevator shaft, Joe. Yeah, I see him. You're in trouble, Bishop. Don't build any more for yourself. I got nothing to lose. They nailed me again. I'll be up at the joint for life. Don't cost nobody should you. There's no way off this roof, Bishop. Throw that gun out here and you follow it. You're out of your mind, cop. Give it up, Bishop. Now, come on, throw that gun out. 
and go on out, Cap, to try to stop me. I'll blow your head off. You all right, Joe? Yeah. How is he? No, I better call an ambulance. Yeah. What's that fill out of his pocket? Wait a minute. Something he'll never use. Yeah? Airplane ticket to Phoenix. Albert Martin Kruger, Harold Nelson Bishop, Thomas Nagel Leahy, and Charles Everett Lee were taken into custody and brought to trial for two counts of robbery in the first degree. They were convicted and received sentence as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. Because of his previous record, Thomas Nagel Leahy was given the maximum sentence and is now serving life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, Folsom, California. Dragnet is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. In the past two months, a thief has broken into 18 markets. There's no lead to his whereabouts. No clue to his identity. Your job? Get him. Friends, stage and screen star Paul Douglas is featured on the Chesterfield poster of the month that's up all over town. Here's what Paul Douglas says about Chesterfields. Quote, I've been smoking Chesterfield for 22 years. They're best for me. If you try them, you'll find they're best for you. Unquote. You know why Chesterfields are best for you? Because they're low in nicotine, highest in quality. And, of course, Chesterfields are really mild, really satisfying. Try them yourself today. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette, Chesterfield. Regular and king size. Best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, December 14th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. We were on our way out of the office, and it was 8.05 a.m. when we got to Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. Sergeant Lindsey Simmons' office. Yeah? Look, did you give it to him? Uh-huh. Yeah. What do you say? Yeah. <laughs> when did he come back? Uh-huh. Well, did he have it for you? Yeah. Well, that'll teach you not to go that route anymore. 
All right, Patrick. Tell the sergeant to call me when he gets back. Right. Oh, hi, Friday Smith. Oh, hi, Lindsay. Morning, sergeant. Just talking to Gene Patrick over at Highland Park. You know him? Yeah, I met him a couple of times. Picked up a youngster a couple of days ago on suspicion of burglary. Brought him into the office, and Patrick talked to him. Yeah. Well, he finally bought it, but the kid didn't have anything to do with the thefts. He told him to go home. Uh huh. Kid told Gene he didn't have the money to get home, so Gene gave him twenty cents. Kid swore he'd come in and pay it back. Did he? Yeah, he came in this morning, gave Patrick two dimes. Told him thanks for believing the story. Mm-hmm. Then Patrick got the kicker. Kid really did break into a house last night to get the money. Well, what's Patrick got to say about that? <laughs> Says the kid's honest in a sort of way. He did pay him back. Well, where's the youngster now? Got him over Highland Park Juvenile. I better call Gene. Maybe I can give him a hand. I got a couple of streetcar tokens I won't be using. Might like to have them. Huh? Oh, hold it. If I was you, I don't think I'd bring it up to him for a couple of days. Well, what can I do for you two? Well, Lindsay, we've been working on a string of burglaries. You maybe got the word on them. I don't think so. What's the story? Bunch of store burglaries. Papers that tagged them. The milk bottle jobs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it seems Hartgrove was telling me something about them the other day. And where do we come in? Well, the way the jobs look, we've been thinking that maybe they belong in your department instead of ours. I figure that. First off, the milk thing. What do you mean? Every job he's pulled, we found an empty milk bottle on the counter. Okay, what's that prove? Well, milk and kids go together. Sure, sort of milk and ulcers. Maybe a thief's got the bull horrors when he gets into the store. No, Lindsay, there's another thing. The way he prowls the places, all he takes is petty cash. Just a couple of bucks outside. Candy, cigarettes, nothing big. Some of the places he's gone into, you could open the safe with a pocket knife. He hasn't even made a move toward him. Maybe he's a kleptomaniac. Got a lot of them on the books. Maybe that's the way he gets his kicks. Oh, it's a nice try, Lindsay. If you know anybody that can climb through a 14 by 10 inch hole, you trot him up and we'll talk to him. Okay, I haven't got the names on my desk, but you take a trip to Santa Anita, you'll meet a lot of them. Jockeys. You guys know we'll go along with you on this thing. Anything we can do, but until we're sure that there's a juvenile involved, there's nothing we can do. Anything turns up, we'll be sure to turn it over to you. Now, look, we're not trying to palm this thing off on you, Lindsay. We've had the stats office make so many runs on small adults that the cards are wearing out. It just seems that none of the leads we've been chasing come out anywhere. We figured that maybe you could come up with some answers for us. Well, that's a new one on me, Joe, this milk bet. I've heard of a couple of thieves who went for it, but I can't name you a juvenile offhand. I'll pass the word around the day watch, see what they can come up with. I'll leave a note for Hartgrove. He can pass it on the night watch. Well, I appreciate anything you can do. No trouble. Been running your ragged on this, huh? It's pretty rough. It's just that we can't seem to be able to come up with anything that adds. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Georgia Street Juvenile, Sergeant Simmons. Yeah. Yeah, they're here. Which one? Okay, hang on. For you, Joe, your office. Thank you. Friday coming. Yeah. Right away. What's the address? Uh-huh. Yeah. No, I got it. We'll leave right away. Who? Yeah, call him. Thanks. Well, come on, let's go. The milk bottle kid, he hit again. The call had come from Lieutenant Ginder in burglary. He told us that he'd just gotten a call from a storekeeper named Monty Derabertus. The man had called to report a burglary at his store at the corner of Jackson and Broadway Streets. Lieutenant Ginder told us that the crime lab had been notified and had dispatched a crew to investigate the premises for physical evidence. Frank and I left Georgia Street Juvenile, and we drove over to Figueroa, then we turned over onto Broadway. The store that had been broken into was a small Italian delicatessen on the southeast corner. By the time we got there, the crime lab crew had already arrived and was winding up their investigation. We walked into the place, and we met with Ray Pinker. Hi, Joe. Frank. Ray. Hi, Ray. How's it going? The usual thing. Bottle of milk on the counter. You want to check it over? Yeah. Come on back here. Thief made his entrance back here at the rear of the store. There it is. Broke out the window pane. Yeah, not very big, huh? It measures nine and a half by twelve and three quarters. Huh. No alarm on the window, huh? Yeah, you can see the wires here. Take a look. Oh, yeah. How come the alarm didn't go off? I talked to the owner. He said he's had trouble with the alarm system the last couple of weeks. Called the company and asked them to fix it. Mm-hmm. He thought it was okay. Guess there's something wrong someplace. Didn't work last night. What kind of alarm was it, Ray? Outside on the building. You know the kind. Yeah. What did he take this time, Ray? Usual run of stuff. According to the owner, there are about four cartons of cigarettes missing, several boxes of candy. He can't be absolutely sure. So he's got to check his stock. It'd be better if you talk to him on that. Yeah, we will. We'll catch him later. Want to wait a minute? I'll check and see how the boys are doing on the prints. Have him check the counter in the milk bottle. All right, thanks, Ray. Be right back. All right. I don't wonder when we're going to blow the whistle on this guy. I don't know. Can't do it fast enough for me. Well, then will you. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Look at this. You know, I'd like to get a couple of those before we leave. What are you talking about? Salami, Joe. Those right there, the hard Italian kind. Mm, See, right there? Yeah. Mm. I remember last summer I was up in San Francisco. Yeah, I remember. Went up there to pick up a prisoner. Remember, you were collecting days off? Yeah, I recall. I had a hundred of them coming. Yeah, <laughs> pretty funny. Anyway, I met Dan Shelley up there. You mean the Irish tenor? Yeah, he and I went down to Cookie's Bar for lunch. Cookie had some of this salami. Sliced it like paper. You could almost read through it. Oh, that's the way it's supposed to be. I know, Joe. 
Anyway, Cookie sliced up a bunch of it, served it with cold cracked crab. Boy, I never tasted anything so good in my life. Yeah, don't you ever read the newspaper through sliced salami? Yeah? No, I never have. Have you? All the time. Just the funnies. Well, anyway, Faye's tried to find them for me. Salami like this. Brought home all kind of things, but she's never found the right kind. You know, they'd be hard enough to pound tax with them. She got them home. Oh, I never forget old Cookie and that spread. <laughs> well, if you can get your mind off food for a minute, and I know that'll be tough. Let's get on with this thing, Joe. Yeah. Sure got to buy some of these before we leave. <laughs> Just like Cookie had. Yeah. Just finish with powder, Joe. Yeah. Nothing. Whoever it was drank the milk, he took the bottle out of the refrigeration compartment. The bottle sweated, and there isn't a print on it we can lift. Oh, that's too bad. None of many places, huh? No, yeah, we've gone over the place from top to bottom. So there, we can't find them. Well, that's not much help, is it? Came up with one thing. Maybe you can make something out of it. What's that? Outside the window in the back parking lot. Came up with an open package of cigarettes. Don't know if it belonged to the thief. Anything on it? No. Fog last night ruined any prints that were on it. Boys have got it if you want it. Yeah. Well, we'll take a look at it. Looks like everything's against us, huh? Another blank. Don't envy you guys trying to break this one. Most of the time there's a leak someplace. Somewhere along the line, the guy's going to make a mistake and not cover something. Yeah, we've been saying that for weeks. This is either the smartest thief I've ever seen or the luckiest. What's this make for him? Number 19. A lot of chances to take for nothing. He's not getting anything out of the jobs. Maybe he isn't, but we are. What? Headaches. a.m. We talked to the victim. He told us that as near as he could figure, there was approximately $4 stolen from the store. He went on to say that he'd ascertained that five cartons of cigarettes and several boxes of candy bars were taken. He was unable to tell us if any other merchandise was taken until he'd made a complete inventory. He went on to tell us that there was over $600 in the safe, but that as far as he could tell, there'd been no attempt to break into it. We made a canvas of the neighborhood and talked with the neighbors. None of them recalled having seen any suspicious people in the neighborhood the night before. None of them had seen any suspicious automobiles in the area. The one thing that was apparent was that the thief was working in a definite pattern. He worked only on Friday and Saturday nights, always between 8 p.m. and 12 midnight. Frank and I met with Captain Bernard, and it was decided that we would maintain a rolling stakeout in the area in which the suspect operated. Four other cars from Metro Reserves were assigned to work with us. For the next five nights, we worked without results. It was slow and tedious, but considering the lack of information on the thief, it was the only way we had left. We had to be on or near the scene when the thief struck again. Saturday night, December 19th, Frank and I met and drove out to the area. The streets were crowded with early Christmas shoppers. I'll sure be glad when it's over. Why? What's the matter? How many rooms in your apartment, Joe? Three. You know that. You've been there. Yeah. No, there won't be enough room. What are you talking about? Faye. What's Faye got to do with this? Hack, Joe. Real hack. Why? What's the matter? I got up this morning. I felt great. Faye's got breakfast on the table. All nice. A couple of eggs, little pig sausages. Nice, you know. Yeah. I come down to the table. She's got food on. And I hit her with it. What, the food? No, Joe. I hit her with what I'm about to tell her. I tell her I'm going to have to work tonight. Mm-hmm. You've worked every night this week. What's wrong with that? Well, that's the way I figure it, so I got a way out. You have, huh? Mm-hmm. Today is Faye's birthday. Well, you didn't tell me. It's not good to tell people, Joe. Oh, it isn't? No. Faye's over 30. Yeah, I kind of figured that. Don't you get it? <laughs> I'm sorry, pal. You left me a couple of blocks back on this one. Look, Faye... I may never catch up. Faye's over 30, Joe. She's getting to the point where she's taken off years, see? How can you give a person a, a last birthday present? Yeah. I tell you about it, you're going to give her a present. Only now instead of 30, she's 29. You understand? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, no. But as long as you do, it's perfectly all right with me. Yeah. What about this morning? Well, I told her I was going to have to go to work. I got this present for her. Brand new deep fat fryer. Real good. What? All wrapped up. Deep fat fryer. All wrapped up with ribbon. Beautiful. Shiny. Beautiful. So you gave it to her. Did it do any good? Not a pound. You know what she does with it? Well, at this point, I wouldn't even want to guess. I'm serious, Joe. This may mean the end of my home. Go ahead. She doesn't even open it. Just puts it in the closet on the back porch. Doesn't even pull the paper apart to peek at what's in it. Real mad, Joe. She may not let me back in the house tonight. Well, you can apologize when you get home. I don't know, Joe. Faye's pretty sore. Didn't even open the present. Not Wait a even minute. a peek, huh? Listen. Yeah, tell where it's coming from. Yeah, sounds like up on 7th. Come on. Yeah, right here. Pull up. Come on. I'll take the front. All right. Hey, 
Frank, hold it up there. Police officer, stop or I'll shoot. Frank, he's coming around your way. Okay. Take it easy. Go ahead and shoot. Go on and kill me. Go ahead and shoot me. It doesn't matter anymore. Go Everything on. all right? Yeah. Just a kid, Joe. Mm, I see. What are you doing in the store, son? What do you think I'm doing? He asked you a question, son. Pretty stupid. What do you think I was doing? How many stores you broken into, son? Figure it out for yourself. Look, what do you got a chip on your shoulder You're for? big guys. Don't give me a lot of conversation. Do what you want to do. All right, boy, you call it. Come on. Eleven fifty p.m. We called the office and told them that we had a subject in custody and that we were taking him to Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. We put the boy in our car and we waited until a radio car arrived. We asked the officers to notify the owner of the store and stand by until he got there. We also asked that they make a four fifty nine report. Eleven fifty five p.m. We started to take the youngster to the juvenile bureau. What's your name, son? What difference does it make? Acting like that isn't going to help you. You guys pick me up, remember? You worry about it. I got nothing to be afraid oh, of. Oh, yes, you have, boy. You could have been shot back there. Maybe you should have pulled the trigger. Look, son, what's the matter with you? Why are you acting like this? You just got real lucky back there. That's the only reason you're alive now. It was dark in there. As far as I could tell, you were an adult. You didn't stop when I told you to. Now, according to the book, I could have shot you. You know that, don't you? Killing the kid. That'd make you a big man. No, I'm just bringing it up to prove a point. Say it. Now, look, son. I'm going to tell you something. When you break into a place at night, you're not a kid anymore. You're asking for trouble. you got both your pockets full of it. The way you work tonight makes us think you're mixed up in a lot more thefts than just tonight. That right? You ever been arrested before? No. Never been in trouble with the law, huh? Sure. I'm a real criminal. I got a ticket once for riding my bike through a boulevard stop. Radio car stopped me and tagged me. Big deal. But they're going to send me to San Quentin. Maybe you can give me the gas chamber. How old are you? What difference does that make? How old are you? You figure. All right, you look like you're about 11 to me. That's what everybody thinks. I'll be 15 my next birthday. Don't kid us, son. It's the truth, 15. That's what I'll be, 15. When were you born? 1939, November 2nd. You're small for your age, aren't you? Why do you say that? Aren't you? It's got nothing to do with it, nothing at all. I can do anything any other kid can do. Anything. Don't you forget that. What's the matter with you? Is that a sore point with you? Huh? Your size. Is that a sore point? There's nothing wrong with my size. Doctor says that I'm all right. Just that some people aren't meant to be as big as others, that's all. There's nothing wrong with me. No, no, come on, son. What's your name? Now, look, you know we're going to find out. How are you going to find out? We will. Now, why don't you save us all a lot of time and tell us the truth here? It'd be better if you did. If I do tell you. You going to put it in the papers? What? I tell you, there are going to be a lot of reporters around. My name going to get in the papers? Not from us. Can't tell you, then. You mean if there's no reporters around, you aren't going to tell us your name? Is that it? That's the way it is. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Maybe that's the way it looks to you. Where do you live? Can't tell you that either. But you've got things all wrong, son. It isn't what you want to tell us. That's got nothing to do with this. You're going to tell us what we want to know sooner or later. Where are we going? Georgia Street. That's where the jail is. Why do you ask that? Because I want to know. Yeah, there's a jail there. Reporters? What? They're going to be reporters there. What is this thing with reporters in you? What's this all about? Reporters put your name in the papers, don't they? Sometimes. Well, you get the reporters all lined up. You get them from all the papers. You have them there, and I'll tell you all about it. The whole story. You just get the reporters and the photographers. Be sure about them, because I want some pictures, too. Well, look, let me get this straight. What? You say you aren't going to give us any information without the press being there. Is that right? That's the way it's going to be. Well, you got it wrong, boy. What? Doesn't make any difference who's there. You're going to come around. Yeah. We'll find out. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Smokers by the thousands are now changing to Chesterfield because they're learning the facts about Chesterfield. Facts like these. A doctor has been examining Chesterfield smokers for 20 months, almost two full years now. We've just received his latest report, and it confirms again no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's a matter of record. And so is this. Chesterfield is the only cigarette proved highest in quality, low in nicotine. Those are the facts about Chesterfield. More good reasons why Chesterfields taste so good. Smoke so much milder. How about it, friends? Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Chesterfield. 
regular and king size. Best for you. Twelve ten a.m. We got to Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. Frank pulled the car into the side alley, and we took the subject out of the back seat. Up this way, son. It's a seedy-looking place. Yeah, well, it's been here a long time. Looks like a set out of a picture. And don't you worry about it, huh? You want to take him down the hall, Frank? I'll check with Hargrove. Yeah, come on, boy. Hi, Friday. You're working kind of late, aren't you? Yeah, we are. I got the note from Simmons on the milk burglaries. Checked around the night wise. Nothing on it, so I didn't call you. I don't think you have to worry about it. I think we got the answer. Yeah? We just picked up a kid. We got him dead to rights in the market. Open bottle of milk right next to the cash register. Where is he now? Frank's got him down the hall. You think he's your boy? Yeah, it looks like it. Everything adds up. The entrance, what he tried to take, the milk. All along, seems to fit. You got that kind of a case. What are you worrying about? There's two things. Yeah? Who he is and why he did it. He won't tell you? No. He's got some big thing working about the press. Says he won't give us anything without reporters being there. Makes it rough, Joe. You know the policy. Yeah, I do. He won't let us help him. If he wants publicity, take me down. Introduce me as a reporter. Well, it might do it. Won't do any harm to try. Let's go. Go ahead. Thanks. Who am I going to be? Well, tell him you Sid Hughes from the mirror, huh? Yeah, might as well be one of the good ones. Son, you wanted to talk to somebody from the papers. It's against the policy, but we swung it for you. This is Sid Hughes from the mirror. Hi. You the fellow that held that guy on the phone in Baltimore? Yeah. Great. I read all about it. You going to write me up like that? I hope not, son. There were two men killed in that operation. I read all the stories. Everybody did. That's how I mean for you to write me up. With a picture. What makes you think you got it coming? You break into one store and try to steal a couple of cartons of cigarettes? That doesn't make the first page. One store? I got into 19 of them. 19 before they caught me. That's important, isn't it? That's a story. I don't know. It might be. A couple of things we better get straightened out here. First off, what's your name? Better get your notebook out. Be able to take all this down. Don't worry about it, son. You just answer the questions. I'll get it. Yeah. Okay. My name's Elroy Graham. That's E-L-R-O-Y-G-R-A-H-A-M. Yeah. How old are you? I told you once. Almost 15. You said you'd broken into 19 stores. Is that right? Yeah. 19. Might have made it more, but something went wrong tonight. Had trouble with the burglar alarm. Thought I'd turned it off. Bad mistake. He's still working, but it wasn't for that. Guess it only takes one, though. Huh, Mr. Hughes? Yeah, I guess so. You want to tell us why you did it? What? You had to have a reason for committing these robberies. You want to tell us what it was? Sure. Good reason. Real good. All right, tell us. Well, you see, I always had trouble at school. Never seemed to quite make it. All the guys like me. They all did. All the girls do, too. Got girls calling me almost every night, asking me to take them to dance and stuff like that. I don't go much for stuff like that. You can understand, can't you, Mr. Hughes? Go ahead, all right. Well, they wanted me for all the teams, football, basketball... All the time asking me to play. But I figure if you want to get ahead in the world, you got to have a name. Some place where you want to get. Figure out that. Work for it and you're going to get there. Don't you find that true, Mr. Hughes? Go ahead. That's the way it was with me. All the time turned down offers to be on some team. Telling some girl that I couldn't take her to a dance. Just didn't have the time. Somehow I just couldn't make it. You can understand it. You've been around. You know all the successful kind of people. You write something and a lot of people read it. You know what I mean. Don't you? Well, what's the matter? Something wrong? I'm trying to tell you what happened. I'm giving it to you straight. What's the matter? Now you want to tell us the truth, Elroy. What? I don't know why you're trying to sell us this line, boy. It isn't necessary. I don't know why you did what you did, but I do know you had a reason for it. Now, that's all we want to know. Just the reason. You don't believe me? Afraid not. How about you? No, son, I don't. Mr. Hughes? No. Can't even lie right. <laughs> Can't even tell a lie good. All my life I've been trying to be like other kids. All the time getting beat up, getting left out of things. You know why? Do you know? Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Big reason. Biggest reason in the world. Because <laughs> I'm almost 15 years old and I'm four feet seven inches tall. Four feet seven. Weight 97 pounds. That ain't very big, not big enough. All the time, other kids shoving you around. All the time, you're the joke. Gets to the time when you figure it's easy to laugh, too. Because if you don't, some kid's going to beat you up. 
gets to the point where you don't care anymore. I used to clip out those coupons and send them in. Get the books back on how to build myself up. Worked at it. Didn't do nothing for me. I was still four feet seven and weighed 97 pounds. All the stuff I took didn't do no good. Still came out four feet seven, 97 pounds. All right, so do you want to tell us about the burglaries? I did it to be big, that's why. I had the things other people wanted, cigarettes, candy, the other things kids wanted. I had all that stuff that the other kids wanted. <laughs> Made me important. Don't you see that? you got to understand it, Mr. Hughes. That's why I wanted my picture in the paper. That's why I wanted the story. So the kids would know that I'd done something big. So they know. <laughs> all right, son. It's going to be all right here. No, it isn't. Like everything else I tried to do, I loused it up. I didn't mean to steal, but it, it was the only thing to do. The only way I had. Now, wasn't there some other? No. No, there wasn't. All the time, the other kids laughing. All the time, talking. I just couldn't stand it anymore. I just couldn't. <laughs> Here you go. Thanks. You can understand it, can't you? It makes sense. What's that, son? Wasn't so much the kid saying I was little. Yeah. But I didn't want him to think I was small. Twelve thirty six AM. We contacted the parents of the Graham boy and asked them to come down to the station. We talked to them for an hour and tried to fill them in. In view of the fact that the parents of the subject were responsible persons, the boy was booked for violation of section four fifty nine PC delinquent. And he was released to his parents pending his hearing in juvenile court. Five days passed, and we heard nothing from the boy. On December 24th, Frank and I checked into the office. Friday? Yeah, Earl. Get in the back. Let's see you and Smith. Okay, thank you. Hi, Mr. Friday. Oh, hello, Elroy. What can we do for you? Well, I guess you think it's kind of funny. What's that? I want to tell you that I sure think it's good what you did for me. Help me with that burglary thing the other night. Well, it isn't over yet, son. The court still has to make a decision on it. Yeah. But what you did to make me feel better. As far as I'm concerned, whatever the judge decides, I'll go along with it. I had a long talk with my folks. So we got it all talked out. All the way talked out. Well, that's good, son. We're glad of it, son. Maybe you guys won't like it. I mean, me knowing you such a short time and all. But, but I wanted to bring you these. Merry Christmas. Well, that's awful nice of you, all right, but it's necessary. I want to give them to you anyway. For what you did for me. Well, that's mighty nice of you, all right. Sure appreciate it. A couple of packages of cigarettes. Hope they're the kind you smoke. Yeah, son, they'll be fine. Thanks, son. Well, see you guys around, huh? Yeah, sure, son. Just one more thing, Sergeant. Yeah, son? Just thought you'd like to know. Yeah, what's that? I didn't steal those. <laughs> The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On the 21st of December, a petition was filed in juvenile court on behalf of the subject. On January 26th, trial was held in Department 52 of Juvenile Court, State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, Thanksgiving is traditionally a time when families and friends get together. And I'd like to make this suggestion. Tomorrow, get a couple of cartons at Chesterfields. You'll be all set for Thanksgiving and the weekend. We know you, your family, and guests are sure to enjoy America's most popular two-way cigarette. Chesterfield. Regular and king size. Best for you. <laughs> Roy Merton Graham appeared before the juvenile court where he admitted the alleged burglaries. At this time, under the counsel of the judge of the juvenile court, the subject was placed under the care of the probation department for a period of three years, with the provision that his parents take him to a competent psychiatrist. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget your letter carrier when he makes a special trip to call on you for muscular dystrophy. Reach in your pocket. Give for muscular dystrophy. <laughs> You 
have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Jack Crucian, Olin Soule, Sammy Ogg. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely new Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspaper for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork tip Fatima? It's the smooth smoke, with Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering, and Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Fatima is made and guaranteed by Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. Try Fatima today. <laughs> Hear Merrill Muller and the news next on the NBC Radio Network.